Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Constructed Criticism. I'm your host, Spencer. I am joined by my co-host, Sil Silver Pro. Ugh, that sounded wrong. Still Silver Pro, Michael Hinderocker. Yeah, I mean, for better or worse, status doesn't usually change that fast. They can't kick me out yet. <laughs> uh, so how, I heard you uh, you lost in the top eight of a RPTQ this weekend. I did indeed. So That usually feels playing. okay because like, you re-qualify, but for you it's like did absolutely nothing. Well, yeah, so it did nothing, but like on the flip side, I was like I, I was already technically qualified for the Pro Tour. So it like did absolutely nothing in the truest sense of that word. <laughs> It just actually, so how do I feel about it? I mean, you feel nothing. I'd rather have won, but like, <laughs> it's fine. We're also joined by one of my personal heroes, a man. Oh, look at his eyes go up. You know, I say that I, like he doesn't know uh, a man that brought Canadian magic onto the map. My hero, K.Y.T. Well, I actually forgot. I forgot you've, you've said this uh because now you're just doing you're you're I just see you as someone that has done a lot for the game as well. So to put myself in like hero status along with I think PV is your second hero is kind of it's kind of nuts. So <laughs> well, uh, yeah. So it's it's PV Marshall and KYT. Uh, <laughs> one of those is not like the other. <laughs> but you know, I, I think that when you look at Someone who has a real impact on their community. I think that you and PV stand very different from Marshall, right? Like, but but for you know Latin American magic, uh, Paulo is is you know Paulo and Willie are are just these huge icons in their countries, uh, in their in their not even just their country in their <laughs> hemisphere. And for you, it's you know you you saw an opening and a Something that could be changed, and we're going to get into that with the content side. Uh, and but I, I really, really have always appreciated the fact that I can always come to you. Um, and besides your trolling for me to get uh, Mike Flores on the podcast, like you always give great advice, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> not that not that getting Mike Flores on the podcast isn't great advice, but <laughs> you just also always say that. <laughs> I think it would make for a great show just because of the potential clash, you know. Hey, I, you know, uh, uh, I feel like my disdain for Mike changed a lot after we met, and I think that we're 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 good now. I like Mike. Yeah, I think he that's he, not what I want to hear. So he comes across differently online than he is in person, and he's like legitimately a great guy in person, like legitimately. I I would spend a lot of time with Mike. Uh, I think I think he's a pretty cool guy, so. But <laughs> you just want to see us fight. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's get right into this. So KYT this week is going to talk to us about the power of magic content and um, something very different than our than our normal show, right? Like we usually talk about little things that make you better at magic, and we want to talk about content creation and how it can make you better at magic, and also the kind of content that you should be seeking out to get better at magic. Before we get there, though. Let's talk about our sponsors really quick. So don't forget to check out both of our sponsors at Oasis Games at uh, mtgoasis.com and the Mana Base. Oasis Games is the best place to buy Magic the Gathering singles. If you are looking for it, they probably have it, and they have it at a pretty good price. And if you want an even better price, you can use the code CCMTG at checkout to get 15% off of your first order. This is going to put Oasis Games below basically everything else. Like, I don't know that you can get 15% off Oasis Games and find a better price. Um, We've had people buy legacy decks, modern decks, cubes, like entire collections that they wanted using 15% off to really get the most out of that first code. And if you want 5% off of every order, use the code, uh, would that be good with no spaces? And you can get 4% off of every order. The Mana Base is our other sponsor. You can check them out at uh, the Mana Base. You can also check out their sponsor at Fusion Gaming. If you're looking for sealed product, Fusion Gaming is the place to get it. Even though they're a direct competitor <laughs> to the place where KYT works, Fusion Gaming is uh, the place to uh, buy your sealed product in Canada. Uh, and they also ship to the U.S. $2 shipping uh, everywhere across North America. So check them out at Fusion Gaming. And you can get uh, $2 shipping on all of your orders. And uh, let them know that we sent you. Uh, we really appreciate having a sponsor that sells sealed product as Oasis Games doesn't sell it. Um, and Fusion Gaming and 
The men in base have been really kind to us, so check them out and check out their other content creators like Nikachu, the Merfolk Master, who's GP Top 8 competitor. Uh, tons of awesome content, even though he smashes Maze's face into the ground every time he plays him. So You're supposed to say something there, Michael. <laughs> well, I, I just I'm just enjoying that. I'm gonna I'm gonna let I'm gonna you're gonna let, let that in. stand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't forget to check out our other shows on our network. You can check out uh, Limited Time Only, another podcast hosted by me. Uh, it's a podcast about getting better at Magic: The Gathering with a focus on limited play. Uh, Danny and I like to focus on sealed every week as well as draft. To really help the PPTQ grinder. We understand that sealed is important. We understand that draft is important, and we want to give you a podcast that does both every week because when you are going into your first P your limited PPTQ, you need to be ready for it. You need to be able to have an advantage on that field, and we want to help you prepare. So check out Limited Time Only. You can also check out our other podcast called Common Knowledge, a popper podcast about getting better at Magic the Gathering. There are a total of two popper podcasts out there, guys. You got to check out Common Knowledge. It, these guys are great. They In their second episode, I think, or the third episode, they brewed decks for popper. They were like, all right, these are the decks that we just brewed up Go try them out. And we've already seen five O's with one of their deck lists. Like, you have to go check out this podcast. These guys are crushing it. Former co-host Manny Merez is awesome. Um, he's a former co-host of this show. He wanted to get into Popper, and he really helped out Kyle Novus, the newest co-host. So check them out at Common Knowledge. If you want to support this podcast directly, you can do it by going to patreon.com slash ccmtg. Become a patron of the show. We want to give a shout out to our newest patron, Ray Stacy. Ray, we really, really appreciate it. Every time we get that notification letting us know that somebody else has checked out our Patreon and have, has thought that we've done enough to value just like a dollar a month, right? Like we've done something that you felt that you got enough value from to give us money. And that that's unreal. And we really appreciate it. So thank you so much to Ray, our newest patron. And if you want to be a patron, just go to patreon.com slash ccmtg. There's tons of benefits, including the Patreon question of the week. And this week we have a question that says, my friends and I play test a fair bit. We allow tape backs to make the correct place so that we can get accurate data. I'm starting to wonder if playing this way is preparing me for quote, real magic. Do you guys allow a combination of no take backs and take backs, or do you have a set way you play test? Michael, I'll let you answer this question first. Okay, so I end up playing quite a bit um, and I think when I'm trying to get a feel for the texture of a matchup, I don't want that to be based on poor play. So if, if I'm trying to figure out what a matchup looks like in general, I, I really like kind of thorough discussion of lines over trying to play technically perfect magic. Um, but basically what I would say is that a lot of the time I separate deck selection from practice and deck selection comes with a lot of that style of magic, actually practicing with the deck that I would like to play at an event or uh, things like that. I, I'll usually play on Magic Online rather than play testing against friends um, specifically for that reason. I think that playing all of your games allowing take backs is probably wrong, but I would also caution against trying to specifically beat your friends and then broadly applying that data. What, what you're really trying to do when you're when you're doing that is get data and thoughts from both of you on how the games feel, what, you know, are, are we sideboarding correctly? Uh, am I sequencing this correctly? So that we can learn more about both decks and why the matchup plays out the way it does. Yeah, I think that when we test for like a pro tour and like we're in a room together as a big group, we almost always are allowing take backs, right? It's never even a question. Because what you're really trying to figure out is like what the matchup actually is, right? So right. like, how does this feel in the end? That's the other thing is like, how does this matchup feel is way more way more impacted by making the correct plays, right? So like, if I'm making the correct play, what does this matchup end up looking like? Whereas when I want to like jam a deck and I want to understand my deck, I might go jump in a league or two on MTGO to get a different kind of feel. But it's not the same thing as the kind of playtesting that I do when we get in a group of six people or or eight people and go in a room and just jam for the entire day. They're, they're just different things. The kind of playtesting that I think this player person's talking about is is just a different thing. KYT, what's your take? I mean, I think Michael just answered it perfectly, and you followed it up. Uh, 
for for me, I, I because I still struggle personally with uh, due to lots of downtime in between. Um, I I generally want to focus on just clean technical play first. So for me, it was most of my time is really spent on just sharpening my skills. So uh, not allowing takebacks um, early, just so I can get to a level where um, I can I get get punished for my mistakes and. Later in the week, as we start to get closer to the tournament I want to compete in, that's when we start like like taking away when I don't need. It's kind of it's sort of like the reverse. I would feel from I'm starting to like say what I do, and it sounds super counterintuitive <laughs> as the week goes on. I, you want to do it the, now that you're saying it. You want to do it in the reverse order. I don't know. Just like for me, technical play matters more than than learning the matchup, and that's why I want to focus on it more. Like there's there's just more odds that at the tournament I just forget how an interaction works, or I just don't get punished enough during practice to really remember what the best play is. So that's why I think eighty percent of my time would be more focused on that aspect than than learning the matchup because I think I can figure it out either that in less time or I can either have articles or people I trust actually have played the matchup a lot, give me that info. So, and usually I can just run a bunch of leagues, uh, like Mike said, to, to really um, also to see if I was missing anything. But uh, for me at this stage, and it has been since I've started competitively, I'm still not super sharp um, to like a level that I'm, I'm happy with. So that's, that's why I focus on that stuff so much. That's why I generally just pick a deck and just grind with one of the top three decks and just try to make sure I don't make any punts, like the least amount of punts possible on, on the day of rather than, you know, really, really seeing how uh, the matchup plays out. Yeah. I think a lot of the time when we're, uh, sorry, when we're, uh, allowing takebacks we're still trying to figure out what deck we'd like to play Absolutely. and basically the, and basically the idea is that if we're playing games where we've clearly made a mistake continuing with the knowledge that we've made a mistake is sort of pointless and that you know we're we're just trying to figure out and it's, who's it's winning usually, when both players play well it's usually in like these days where we're getting to like we get into a group for like a GP that we're all going to, or like we're we're helping people test for a pro tour, right? It's it's almost never like I'm testing for a game day, or I'm like, it's not <laughs> random play testing. It's like no, like we're getting in a room, and this is this is what we're doing today. Like if you're here today, this is this is the thing that we're doing. The difference, I think, I I actually want to harken back to the time before leagues existed on MT, on MTGO. So before leagues existed, we had another testing team that we had where what we would actually do for a little while is that we would uh, have a... <laughs> we would put a dollar on every game that we played. <laughs> so, like, if you won, you got a dollar. If you lost, you had to give the other person a dollar. This was... This actually kind of simulates what the leagues do, right? Like, if you're in a competitive league, you're actually betting money that you're going to 5-0, right? Like, that's really what's happening. Uh, and I think that we did that early on uh, when we wanted to do different things, right? Like we would still have the playtesting where like we'd proxy up decks, we'd sit down in, I, we'd, we'd do it at my, at my uh, old uh, apartment. We'd have a, we had a big table that fit like six people and we'd just jam and jam and jam and jam. And then we'd switch. We'd be like, all right, we all know what decks we like. Like, let's just play games, put a dollar in every game, put a, or I think sometimes we even put a quarter in every game, just like put something on the line. And I think that they're just very different things that you're doing. One of them is doing what KYT is talking about, right? Like it's trying to perfect you. Like it's like I need to get myself in a in a state where like the thing that I'm doing matters versus I need to understand what's happening in this matchup. And they're just different things and you have to approach them in a little bit of different ways. Yeah. So. Yeah, I agree with that. So thank you so much for the question. We really, really appreciate it. If you are a patron of $5 or more, you can actually submit a deck doctor. We don't have a deck doctor this week, but every week on the podcast, we invite patrons of $5 or more to submit a deck doctor. That allows them to uh, submit us a deck list. And then we talk about the things that we love, the things that we would change, and the, where we think the deck stands today. So if you're a patron of $5 or more, come into the uh, Constructed Critics group. Become a Constructed Critic, and we will talk about your deck uh, next week on the show. So let's move on to our next segment and the actual point of this podcast, which is hashtag always improving. Hashtag always improving is exactly what we believe in. We believe if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. And we want to be doing what we can all of the time to be getting better at this game. 
we got Rob in the chat here, so uh, we better be on point, guys. We better be on point. But, uh, Michael, what did you do this week to try and improve at Magic the Gathering your life in general? Well, I uh, I lost an RPTQ Top 8, which, you know, sucks on Wait, some level, you, but at the you, same time... The way you improved was losing in your first PTQ Top 8, because you've won every other one. <laughs> well, you know, you got to lose here and there. Got to Got to keep it fair, so... So I, I did some losing this weekend, and uh, it just helps me refocus. Just just trying to refocus from that, uh, move on with picking up a new deck for next weekend. I'm unsure if I'm going to run back the same deck or play something new, but just just kind of moving past that event and trying to figure out what to play going forward. I, I think one of the really sweet things about Magic is that for better or worse, you don't get to rest on your laurels for very long. You... Uh, you know, you lose, you got to play again. You win, you got to play again too. So, so you played green black um, mid range basically, just like a green black rock mm -hmm. deck with yep. Dream Stealer post board. Um, what what do you what what are you thinking about the deck going into next week? And like, what makes it good this week? Good last week, in your opinion, and then not sure about it the next week. Like, that's a pretty big shift, right? Like, that's a one week difference. What are your thoughts on that? It's just kind of how standard it is. It's always sort of a week to week thing. Um, but I thought, you know, has I, I was pretty happy with like the mono red matchup, uh, both pre and post board. Um, I had a plan that I liked for zombies. I only played against zombies once and I lost. But you know, two games is not exactly a lot of data, so hard to hard to say from there. But uh, some of some of what makes me interested in looking at different decks is just expanding my range a little bit just like looking at stuff from last week and you know when you have when you have just so so basically I, I know where green black is i know the matchups i like i know the matchups i don't like the question is if i have another week am i better off trying to play green black more technically perfect or am i better off investing that time in seeing if there's a better option and i think that given the green black is generally a pretty easy deck. I, I don't feel like to play it at a reasonable level. I need a lot more reps with it. So I think this week is probably better spent trying to figure out if there's something that I like better in terms of positioning. I think that's I think that's perfectly reasonable. I, I think that um, when you play as much magic as you do, Michael, I think that trying everything is usually better. Like uh, <laughs> it, I. Uh, I remember playing Magic as much as you do, and I feel like I played every deck that ever entered a format, and it it really does help you. Like, it really, really does. Because it means that when you go to pick a deck, you're like, well, I already know both sides of this matchup because I played both sides of this matchup, like, a lot. And right. that, I mean, that is, you, that's you kind of least, invaluable. I think sometimes being right is less important than having a plan. Exactly. And although your plan might not be perfect, just having an idea of how you want to sideboard, how you want to sequence, what what cards you're interested in having in your 75 for specific matchups. Just just having an idea, having a concrete idea, even if it's not perfect, does you a lot of good. I mean, early on, we talked about, you know, we, we stole that G.I. Joe quote, right? Like, knowing is half the battle. And what you're talking about here is, well, I can know Green Black way more than I already do, but I feel like I know it pretty well. So instead, I can invest my time in other places to re to really gain an advantage elsewhere. Yeah, I think standard just changes too much for mastery of an archetype to generally matter. matter I think that so too. Much. Yeah. So uh, I'll go next. So for me, uh, I I did something I haven't done in a long time. I took a vacation. So for those who didn't notice, I've been gone for like three days. I uh, got back uh, late last night. Uh, wrote this show and. Honestly, it was cool to be away from technology. I think I stressed KYT out because he like messaged me. He's like, "What are we talking about?" <laughs> but, but um, yeah, I, I uh, went on a boating trip with my family, uh, where uh, basically the only time I got online was actually to play test with Michael late at night, um, and that's it. Like, I played a little bit of Magic, uh, went went kneeboarding, and my like arms, I can barely lift them. Like, it was really fun. And it was honestly a break that I really needed. Uh, magic content while playing Magic and being a dad and being a you know associate product manager at a at a big company is all like 
a lot of work and I really needed this break and it feels really good. Um, however, I have never felt less prepared for a GP in my entire life. <laughs> so, uh, but, but it feels good. Like I know about a couple of decks within what I'd be willing to play. Um, or if Michael tells me something is broken, I'll just play that. But uh, like, it, it felt good to take a magic break and to, to, I mean, take a magic break. I played magic this, this week, but I don't know. It, it just felt kind of felt nice to get on the lake and, and kind of be away from everything for a minute. And I think that everybody needs that. And I think that's why so many people quit magic is that they get into the grind and they don't know how to take like a three day break. They don't know how to take like a month break. Right. <laughs> three days. <laughs> they can't take three days. <laughs> well, you work for you and Michael both work for Magic the Gathering Store, so three day breaks for you is like your little vacation. But it, it was nice. It was a it was a nice little break. So KYT, um, for this segment for hashtag goes improving, I'd like you to talk about what you've what you'd like to what you've done. But before we get to your hashtag always improving, I'd like to ask you some questions from our listeners, if that's okay. Go ahead. So the first question is how do you balance working on magic stuff and actually playing magic? Yeah, that's a, that's a challenge for, for both me and you, Spencer, uh, just because I, I know you and we've talked a lot about it. And it's a huge challenge and something that I didn't... took took a while for me to really, really optimize because a long time ago, back when I was still in high school, college, I would play every Friday night, do FNMs. I would go to the card shop probably every weekend, like maybe even both weekends, just playing or drafting, just really intense. And well, now me working for face to face doesn't really, it's not any different than any full-time job that I've had. It is a challenge and it has come down to basically, I feel like I'm list, like answering Reminds me of those fighters that get really old and talk about them streaming, streamlining their techniques and their training to like shorten it to be the most high impact. And I think that's what I'm doing now where it's like magic online is, is the most convenient way for me to get reps. in. so that's why I use that. And I try to find different ways to streamline that process, find friends that I trust to, to also play test with or get results from. So I don't have to, uh, necessarily just play randoms and take forever to get results. I can play with someone I know. We can discuss, get max results. So it's become sh using the little time that I have, but really, really uh, getting the maximum out of it. You know, I uh, I remember our, like when you asked me about my date night. <laughs> so something that KYT is referring to is I actually don't play Friday Night Magic. Uh, Friday Night is actually dedicated to my wife. And this had to happen when PPTQ started. It was like, I like if I'm gonna be playing Magic almost every Saturday until I win one, like <laughs> Friday night just belongs to her. Like she gets it. And this is this is something that I think that a lot of Magic content creators have a problem with, is that they do so much content in the wrong, like they don't compact it enough. So for me, like you'll notice that we have, I think we have five YouTube videos. So we have. We have, if there's a weekday that you have, you can watch a video on our YouTube channel. And I can pack a lot of those videos into one day. So I do the Deck Tech and the Wednesday Night Warrior on the same day. I record them the same day. I usually release them the same day. And it's a lot of work. But like my wife knows that those hours are dedicated to that. And then I go upstairs and I hang out with her for the rest of that day. And then Friday, every day is her day. And doing magic stuff on the side of magic is. It's it's hard, and you'll notice that, um, like you might you might start seeing people who have this balance. They might stream more. They might do what KYT said, right? Like they might have like people that they go to, right? The reason to surround yourself with a team of people is so that you have to do less work. <laughs> like that's actually the reason. It, it's just super helpful to have those people around you. So, KYT uh, Mason has two questions for you. If the first question is, what is your favorite part of Magic? Wow. That is very, very broad. <laughs> I think... Interact with Spencer Howland, obviously. <laughs> Spencer Howland. <laughs> uh, the way I say your name is... is, is Spencer Howland! <laughs> um, I think that... Uh, wow, there's just too many things. 
there's like the community aspect of it and i still enjoy the competitive aspect of it but um man my favorite part is still still the com competition of it just uh it's what how i fell in love with it why I used to be uh, one of the top ranked uh, chess players in my province um, and it's what gravit regionals was what gravitated me towards this and it's what now like I used to test myself uh, just as a challenge to myself to see if I can do it again. And so I think the challenge and just because it's just such a challenging game also it's really rewarding to do well just because of especially when you're playing a challenging deck that offers a lot of options and you're against another deck that presents a lot of different uh angles of attack and you manage to maneuver your way optimally it's just it just feels really rewarding so i think a lot of the uh competitive aspects of the game i still love a lot his second question is what is your stance on pineapple on pizza okay i, I think i'm just gonna get grilled by <laughs> one side whichever side <laughs> I think I'm cool with it. I'm cool with it. But hold on. Do you order it? I never order it. But all I right. That's it. good enough for me. And all right. Next question. But I will absolutely eat a slice I, if someone orders quote, it. So. Quote, I never order it is good enough for me. <laughs> uh, Brian, that says, is Eldrazi Tron a bad deck? Probably not. Eat? Probably not. Um, Vincent Thibault, a close friend of mine, seems to be winning any tournament up here. And... Dan Muster, which we've just had on first strike, seems hold to on, be. Dan, hold on. <laughs> Dan said the deck was bad. <laughs> bad, but powerful enough, I guess. And uh, seems to be doing well, keeps doing well. So I think that it's definitely a deck to look at, especially if you don't have a lot of prep time, it seems. This is constructed criticism, man. You can give some constructive criticism. I think, I think it's winning. We had a recent 8K where my friend Vincent won, and he I think he's won two PPTQs with the deck. So um, he's impressed with his results, and he won the Montreal Open, face-to-face -face games open that we had a couple months prior. So uh, results will speak for himself. Do you think, and Michael, you can answer this question too. Like, Michael, when you look at things like, uh, I, I don't know if you were actually playing Magic, but like my ability to like win events with Rug Scape Shift, or like these people's ability to win events with like Eldrazi Tron is, is modern really actually the format people say it is, is modern actually the format where like knowing your deck and knowing the matchup is actually more important than the deck you actually play. I think that's true. A lot of the time. Um, it just, things don't change fast enough for that not to be true. Basically like the fact if everyone played only tier one decks, that might not be true. But because people play what they like to play, there's a lot of value in being supremely comfortable with your own deck. Okay, but you were a, like the Boggles champion for the people, Whoa. right? Like, let's, not, I, uh, let's not bring up my past. <laughs> I think that it like the fact that you like played Infect at the Pro Tour actually hurt people's feelings. <laughs> I don't know why I became the Boggles, guys, because I top four, two regular old style ptqs and then wrote an article and then like reed duke mentioned me in his article of uh like i was the boggle guy so do you, do you think that there's some truth to it though is there is there actually a is is modern the format people are talking about is it the one that because of what michael's saying because of everything that you actually do gain a big benefit for knowing your deck yeah i, I think maybe it's also because um depending on the field, and I, I don't know, <laughs> don't want people to take this the wrong way, but like most people just don't know what they're doing. <laughs> so um, in general, like there's a lot of times when I've seen people just approach uh, a game plan or they just don't sideboard correctly against you and you just uh, gain percentages just by knowing your deck well and not doing the same mistakes as, as they do they do some people will make a lot of mistakes when they even like after the match where my opponent might show me the cards that they cyber in just wanted some opinions and it's just like well i would have never you know done this plan at all so um seeing this come up over and over again just shows like these guys would have been had better results against me in the tournament against other people if they just like stuck to a deck that they knew. So um, yeah, I see that a lot. Just people just don't know what they're doing. I How think that's real, 
Yeah, I think that's real true. And then I think it cuts the other way too, right? That like when you're playing a deck like Boggles, you're not throwing cards willy nilly in your set. Like your plans are conversely going to be pretty good, right? I mean, if you've played a deck for months and months and months, you've probably just had enough experience playing some of these matchups that you're not you're not getting you know you're, you're not, not guessing signing in card. right exactly you just you know what sideboard cards for what matchups david says how did mana deprived.com come to exist and what makes a magic the gathering website successful um <laughs> why the smirk um i i i as a guy that runs a magic the gathering website i'd love your knowledge kyt <laughs> I mean, it all started as a blog, and I've done other blog projects before, whether it be blogging about poker or chess or um, actually, I used to have a YouTube channel where I was just performing car uh, magic with cards. And so I was always into like content creation, and then it, it just dawned on me, like, but nothing stuck, like nothing got a huge following. Until I'm like, why don't I just do it about magic? It's it's the game and the interest that I have the most friends uh, with. Like all my chess friends had just quit the game because it was too hard to keep up. You had to read a ton of books and study a lot to to you know keep improving at that game. And so then I'm like, well, I go to Friday Night Magic all the time. I see the same same group of friends. So maybe and I go to tournaments and meet new friends. So it's the game where I have the most friends in and decided to start a blog and just get a few uh, guest posts on that to, just to see if I can get things going. I remember my first author was Vincent Thibault, the Eldrazi Tron Master up here. And it was funny because I had to convince him that it was going to be a thing. Because when he wrote an article, he just asked me, like, you know, who's going to read this? And I just like, well, no one really knows about my site yet. So I had to convince them that, you know, let's just see what happens. And then this all started around Zendikar, where I reunited with Alexander Hain, uh, a friend that I met in, in at a chess tournament many years prior, like when we were little kids. And I, I'm like, are you are you that kid that I met a long time ago <laughs> at chess? Uh, and then we reconnected and then he started contributing and helping with the edits. And of course, now he's known as, as uh, one of the world's best players, but at the time, no one knew that. No one knew that he was already at that time, probably the best, one of the top 10 players in the country, but no one knew that except uh, like me and a few people who have played against him saw his talent and his skill level. And with that type of knowledge, and Adam Yurchik, and I just hadn't met a lot of friends online that were willing to contribute. And one of my first video series was me, Doug Potter, battling against Mike Flores. So Mike was also jumping on board to help me out. And that was also luck also being the fact that him and I were one of the first few to use Twitter um, from a, uh, like one of the, first people in the magic universe, let's say, to use Twitter. Marshall was also one of the first that I met. So being in like, let's say the first generation of magic Twitter people, that also helped. So like that's oh, sort of snowball. Absolutely. I would say that like, that's how the E-team started. Like if Twitter didn't exist, you wouldn't even have the A-team. Um, it's actually funny. A lot of people don't know this. I used to have a website called mtgbluecrew.com and uh, Kevin Metal wrote for that website. Um, like people were always talking about like how funny he was on Twitter. And I was like, Hey, if you ever want to write magic articles, I'll post them. And he wrote for me. And then they started heavy meta and, uh, man deprived and MTG blue crew actually shared heavy meta for the first, like 10 episodes. Like we actually just both posted them at the same time. Um, and, uh, my, my website, like I shut it down and, uh, heavy meta went on to be like, you one of your premier shows. Like people loved it. People loved it. Yeah, I mean, they had people had tat, like at least two people tattooed themselves with the heavy meta logo, which is uh, mind blowing. Yeah, mind blowing. Like, not, no one's gonna do that with like first strike or a team. Like, no one's gonna do that. I mean, I anyone have a constructive criticism tattoo? I mean, it's, I mean, it's probably a bad thing. Please, like, that's a lot of pressure. Please don't, do don't. That. Please don't. <laughs> I mean, like, heavy metal. Yeah, I actually, I actually am a liar. So most of our listeners now 
Uh, some of them do. For our, our dedicated, so, like, our dedicated listeners know that I was actually supposed to get a tattoo at episode 100. Uh, and I didn't. <laughs> it's but probably I, a good life choice. Uh, but I'll get one. Well, I, Tony, I, Tony has one. Do you know Tony? He has one on his chest, heavy meta. And it's just like... Yeah, I, I want to get uh, CCMTG on my wrist and then always improving around my wrist. But you're uh, one of the hosts, and it's your baby. It's like a fan. If a yeah. fan had like a constructed criticism tattoo on it's their weird. leg or on their I chest, it'd be insane. It'd be insane. It's like, wow. Yeah, but that community is great. Like, the that community is great. And also, I think that Mana Deprived really did a good job of like promoting community, um, other unlike any other website I've ever seen. So congrats to you on that. The other question that he has is uh, also is when, when is Heavy Meta coming back? It's never coming back. Um, I, Kevy, I think, is... It's just people have moved on to different projects. So I think that's never coming back. And they've moved on. Maddie's moved on to Hype Club. Just like I've moved on from A-Team to First Strike. And just different priorities. And uh, maybe they'll do, like, a reunion episode. Just like I might do an A-Team episode down the road. Or a Crazy Talk episode down the oh, road. Can but... I start a GoFundMe for this? I want a J. Boosh KYT... Smitty, Scotty Mac episode. I will start the GoFundMe right now. I think you'll be the only one contributing, but um, I don't think yeah. that's true. I think I don't maybe. Think that's true. What is I, what is the what is the limit? What do I have to get this GoFundMe to KYT? I think whatever Jay needs. I, I, <laughs> the rest of us don't. Well, I don't know. Or I don't need to be. Uh, I do this cast in a heartbeat, so um, it's up to those guys and and. Yeah, just to see if Smitty and Jay and, and, and Scotty can put the time together. But, uh, yeah, Heavy Meta and, and other shows, it's 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 sad for some of these past projects that we we have fond memories of. But, you know, like stuff like Yo! MTG Taps is never coming back. And that was, like, the first uh, podcast. So weird. It's like, uh, like when people ask me about podcasting, I'm like, man, you got to go listen to, like, Pardon the Interrupt. Like, if you want to make a good Magic the Gathering podcast... Like, go back and listen. Go listen to Pardon the Interrupt. Go listen to uh, the first episode, I think, that Marshall did with um, his third co-host. It was the the um, the Quadrant Theory episode. Like, there are just, like, these Magic of the Gathering podcast episodes that, like, you have to listen to. If you, like, want to hear great production value, Pardon the Interrupt is the way to go. If you want to listen to great content, like that episode with Marshall – uh, on the quantum theory is like the way to go, and it, it's so cool that you you're like a you're like a part of this. Like, Barton Andrew was on your network, and people don't even know about it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's it was the best. It it was probably the best Magic the Gathering, Gathering podcast ever. Like, yeah, ever. So you're not the only one that has that opinion. So yeah. So uh, Robert asks about your opinion of Eldrazi Tron, which we we've already covered, and we're gonna cover again. So let's actually go on to our next segment. Uh, which is uh, our power ranking. So every week on the show, we give decks points according to their finish. We give them uh, six points for first, five points for second, uh, four for top four, three for top eight, two for top 32, and one for top 64. And today, we're going to talk about modern. So the the deck coming in with 24 points in fifth place, we have Storm. Uh, oh my goodness, guys. Storm is back. Baral did it. He brought Storm back from the dead. Um, and this deck that we have in front of us actually has Apostle's Blessing in it. Protecting your Baral's and protecting your Goblin. Uh, there's actually no Electromancers in this list. What is happening in this list, Michael? Well, I don't know. I I, I haven't actually looked at that list. I am surprised by the lack of Electromancers, but I could believe that... I mean, Baral is definitely the better of the two. Um, Apostle's Blessing is... An interesting choice. And no, that, that list is playing a Goblin Electromancer. Uh, it's hanging out on the a, left side. A Goblin um, Electromancer? No, it's playing... Oh, it's playing three. Okay. Yeah, okay. That makes more sense. I, I thought I was saying crazy sense. pills for a minute. Um, but yeah, I mean, this deck is like... It, it's pretty good. Um, it's a lot more... It, it, it's basically a deterministic combo when you... Once you cast Gifts on Gibbon with... Uh, an Electromancer or a Brawl in play, they're pretty much just dead next turn, almost no matter what. So I think, I think it's also a, a deck that your opponent determines when you go off more than you do. 
So like with a lot of combat decks, like you just go off when you can go off, and with this deck, you go off when you have to go off. Yeah, I I also have lost at least once to this deck where I died to like Baral into Goblin Electromancer Remand, Goblin Electromancer Remand, Goblin Electromancer Remand, Goblin Electromancer Remand. So you know if you ever want an embarrassing way to lose, just uh, keep that in mind as something that can happen to you. It's a really sure. good time, let me tell you. Yeah. KYT, I know that you haven't uh, you haven't picked up some magic cards recently, but what do you think of Storm making a comeback? Um, Storm actually ended up winning our uh, Halifax Open uh, with over 109 players, <laughs> most players in Halifax ever. So to see it also, you know, do well in, in this tournament. It's it's actually four tournaments, by the way. So it's actually both GPs and both SEGs together. All of these points combined. Um, yeah, make up I, this deck. I think, man, it's time yeah. to pick it up. I, I guess it's the real deal. No, I think it is. I think that uh, for a lot of us who have been following Modern, we've seen the gradual um, snowball effect of this deck picking up more and more steam and people trying to tune it. As Brawl has come into the format, you've realized like, the deck's best draws were always with Goblin, Mac Goblin Electromancer anyway, and this just gives it another one that's actually just better. Yeah, yeah. I... I think just the density of similar effects. Like when you look at this deck, you have eight cantrips plus metamorphos. That's kind of a cantrip ritual. And then you have eight rituals, like along with the eight elect or seven. I guess this is on seven electromancers. Like it's this deck is sort of shockingly consistent. If you haven't played against it very much, it just it does the same thing basically every single game, and it's really good at doing that if undisrupted. And I think, um, you know, I actually lost to this deck. Uh, it was my only loss in the Swiss of a recent PBDQ that I, the last modern PBDQ that I played in, where I gave him a Baral on a, on a Gifts given or something, where, like, I, I just gave him the wrong pile. Um, it, it is, the deck is hard to play against. Like, you don't know the texture of their hand, and the texture of their hand matters on what you do. It, it's just a rough deck to play against. And, yeah, it's, uh, you have you have to be really good at killing the electromancers, or it's very very tough to keep them from getting you sooner or later. I think that also adding Baral and taking out Pyromancer session makes the deck not have to go into two different directions, right? So like with uh, Electromancer, it made your deck fast, and with Pyromancer session, it made your deck grindy, and with just more of one of the effects, just makes your deck streamlined, which just is better for a deck overall, I think. Well, and it's still surprisingly grindy. I mean, you can have it pretty down and out a lot of the time, but like a single past in flames with an Electromancer in play will almost always just kill you in a game that's gone on very long. I think so too. I top deck gifts and given will often kill you. Um, and in the boarded games, if if you're playing a really grindy deck, they're usually bringing in some combination of Blood Moon and Empty the Warrens. And, you know, you can have a plan to grind all you want, but if their turn two is, you know, Ritual, ritual, metamorphose, ritual, sleight of hand, and empty the wardens, like, you're mostly just dead. Yeah. The next deck we have coming in with 26 points is Eldrazi Tron. Almost all of this is thanks to your boy, KYT. Uh, to your boy, Dan. Okay. My guest? <laughs> you're, you, no, he's your boy. You, I mean, he can also be your guest, because he was your guest. But um, I, I think that we've been pretty clear about our opinion of this deck. Um, and I want to, I want to say that I, I do believe this deck does powerful things. I believe it's the best chalice deck in the format. And I think that says a lot, like being the best chalice deck and being a chalice deck in a format where chalice is actually good because chalice is good in this format. There are decks that it's bad against, but like in the matchups where it's good, it's really, really good. Like they can't beat it. And I think that's really important. And something that when you're playing the deck, or you're playing against the deck, there can be some frustration because it's like, well, if they didn't draw this one card, I wouldn't lose. And it's like, well, that's actually why the deck exists, right? If Chalice wasn't in the modern, this deck actually wouldn't be good. It wouldn't even be playable. But because Chalice exists, you get to be the Chalice deck. And it's really good. Michael? Yeah, I mean, I was saying this, I think, when we were still off air, but I think that one of the advantages of playing... A deck like this, and Mantel Drazi kind of falls into the same wheelhouse, is like, even your pretty bad hands still are going to play 
you know, a 3-3 three, three and then a 4-4 four, four and a 5-5 five, five and a, like, even your hands that aren't particularly impressive still basically will play a bunch of slow Tarmogoyfs. And a lot of your opponent's bad hands just, like, actually could never hope to beat that. And I think there's a lot to be said for winning basically every game where both decks are kind of not firing. Because obviously you're going to have some games where you just play, like, two Eldrazi Temples of Thought not seeing your opponent just loses no matter what they had. Right. Yeah. So if you get if you get all of your really high end draws as wins and then all of your opponents really low end draws as wins, you end I mean that's kind of how I always felt about Bantel Drazi. And just Dude, just casting when you're talking, creatures. it hurts me because you're like, man, like when you draw like your Drazi temples and it's like, wait, but what about you like your card draws? Like what's actually your good draw? It's so I mean <laughs> Yeah, no, so I, th I think the weird thing about this deck is that, like, you're kind of playing a bunch of different stuff, and not all the pieces really go together that well. But, I mean, if you just look at, like, the spells in the deck, if you're yeah. really casting any of them, you're pro they're, like, no, there's a you're good. chance they're more powerful, here's, right? Here's my problem. Um, so Dan on First Strike, the podcast that KYT hosts, uh, so if you haven't checked out the First Strike podcast, it goes live every Monday right before our show, um, so you should check them out um, on the Man of Bribe YouTube channel. But Dan actually talks a little bit about like people's hatred of ramp decks in general. I, I We actually did an episode where we talked about ramp versus big mana decks. This is not a ramp deck. When Dan compared this to a ramp deck, it actually like hurt me to my core. I was like, this is not a ramp deck. Like... You you have no control over how how your hand takes you in the way that a ramp deck does. Like your sequencing is is you don't get to control your sequencing. Like your sequencing is dictated for you by just the spells that you could cast. I, I just think that that like when you when you have a ramp deck, you build your deck to cast spells in a certain sequence, and then you try to optimize that with your mulligans and with your play decisions. And when you have a deck like Eldrazi Tron, you have actually no control over either thing. You have no control over your sequencing or the, the way that you can sequence. And that's just, like, actually different than even the deck that Michael's talking about. Right? Like, with Bant Company, with, or with Bant Eldrazi, I'm sorry, like, you actually have control over your sequencing. You've built your deck to optimize for that sequencing. And that's just not true of Eldrazi Tron. You're not built to optimize anything except for Chalice of the Void. Like, that's it. Am I am I wrong? Tell me if I'm wrong. Just tell me. You know, it, it makes sense to me that like not playing the smoothing one drops that you play in Vant, right? I mean, you're, you're playing like you could play Chalice in Vant Eldrazi hypothetically. It's just that you also want to play Ancient Stirrings, right, and Noble Hierarch, right? So you just you don't do that. So you definitely the deck is definitely built with that in mind, right? I mean, you're casting it on one basically every game, one or zero. Those are the only real numbers that. Mm -hmm. It's regularly coming down on it, at least. Um, but I, I think what I, when I'm comparing it to Bantel Drazi, what I'm saying is that in the games where both decks stumble, just playing a bunch of big creatures, like you're going to be, you sometimes you're going to you be slower. You don't, get to decide, you don't get to decide when those big creatures come down. Like, right, no, exactly. Your deck isn't sometimes, built to optimize that thought and you're coming down. Like you don't get to decide that. But when you, like, that's that's my problem with Dan's comparison to a ramp deck, is that when you play a ramp deck, your deck is built to cast certain spells on certain parts of your curve. This Eldrazi deck is actually not built to do that. It's actually just not built with any of that in mind. Right, what I'm saying is I'm not convinced that that actually ends up mattering that much. Okay. KYT, break the tie here, buddy. I, I think I have to side with, uh, with Michael here. Okay. Uh, what, what do you think, so you're... So with ramp, you're just saying like it would do stuff like know that it goes two, four, six, or whatever. Like, exactly. Like you have a you have a plan with what your deck is trying to do, and you mulligan accordingly to that plan. But with Eldrazi Tron, like, are you, like let's say it's game one, right? You don't know what you're playing against. How do you know? Like, is your mulligan just to mulligan into a good hand? Okay, I see what you mean. Like, what what is your plan? Like, okay, I'm gonna mulligan either into turn three card. Or I'm gonna mulligan into turn two thought knots here. Like those are just you're asking for too much. Now that being said, I actually do believe that Eldrazi Tron does the probably the second most powerful thing in all of the meta, right? Behind Scapeshift, it probably actually is the second most powerful deck right now. 
if you're not looking at infinite combos, if you're not looking at things like Storm, which are broken things, like if you're just looking for on pure power level, I think Eldrazi can actually fits into the format pretty nicely, and it has an insanely good Grixis Death Shadow matchup. So coming in with well, 20... So, oh, go so ahead. Sorry, just, just hold on for one second. I think that's one of the reasons, though, that like both this and Scape Shift wins a lot of games like this where neither deck really works, but eventually you just draw... You, you, you draw have lands spell. and mana sources in your deck yeah. that you're going to find the part, the half of your deck you're missing. And I think this deck is basically the same, right? You're going to find either lands. But I don't think you're. I don't think you. I think the reason that Titan Shift does better is because its game plan is more cohesive. So I mean, if you're, I, I think this deck ends up playing like a curve deck a lot of the time. You just don't know whether your curve is going to be two four seven or like one two seven or one four five or one two three, right? Like. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a mystery, but you're trying to piece together the best hand you can through mulliganing. All right. Whatever that may be. Leave a comment on this week's episode. Let us know, like, Dan's comments on First Strike were talking about comparing this to Scape Shift. What are your opinions on that? Like, where where do you stand on what is Eldrazi Tron? Leave a comment. Let us know. Coming up next with 28 points, we have Jeskai Control. This is probably the biggest mover in the history of our show. Like... Oh my gosh. From the it's dumpster just... to third place. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> Jessica Angel comes up with 28 points. Michael, what is going on? This is like a Logic Knot deck. Well, okay. First of all, I actually love Logic Knot. I do too. I don't know that I, don't know that I like the rest of the deck, but I, I Logic Knot is great. So it looks like we're playing Geists and a bunch of Burn and I don't know. I kind of hate Cryptic Command. That's KYT my biggest is... problem with this deck. Is, is Team Geist Cryptic. back? Do they all play Geist, though? I'm not... I, not I all of them, so. but I, I think... think well, but, like, the most popular lists recently are playing... They're playing, like, another creatures. They're not just playing, like, Snapcaster, Queller, and Burn Spells. They're playing, like, a... I've seen a bunch playing, like, Thundermaw, Hellkite, or whatever, but to Team kind Geist, of... To be, like, Team a, Geist a was bigger... was that kind of stuff before. Yeah, <laughs> to be a bigger... A bigger Burn Spell. So... so <laughs> right, something that could feel more than... Go ahead, KYT. Is Logic Knot like the <laughs> innovation here, or? I oh, I think that Logic Knot has been on like people have been trying to figure out how to use this card for a few months. I think that a lot of people have been playing with this card and been like, "Oh, okay, so like this is a real thing to do in modern." Like people don't play around it; it's almost impossible to play around. Like, how do we abuse Logic Knot? Is it's, a thing that I think a lot of people are thinking today. It's basically just counterspell. I think so. I think that it's like... When you're like, playing this many spells, yeah. Yeah, and, and fetch lands and like things like that. Like I, I think that it's been a piece missing in modern for a long time. And uh, I think that a lot of people have been trying to abuse it. And I've seen uh, lots of different blue-white style decks, whether it's blue at red or Esper decks, playing Logic Knot to some success more and more on MTGO. And it was just going to break its way into paper eventually, in my opinion. There was the... I forget who it was, but there was a Japanese player who top aided, I think, GP Kobe in the last few months with like the all four of Jeskai deck. And this is sort of the An innovation where on the that, deck yeah. has gone from there. But I think basically the idea is if you're intending to keep the game short, Logic Knot is just actually counterspell. So if it doesn't have to be super short, but when you're trying to cast your fourth logic knot of the same game, it's not counterspell anymore. But if we're still on turn seven or eight and our opponent is mostly dead, it's it's very unlikely that logic knot can't just counter basically anything for two or three mana. Are you guys seeing uh, this as like a meta shift of them just adjusting to the influx of Death Shadow? I think I think this deck actually more preys on decks that are good against Death Shadow than Death Shadow itself. It okay. is good because it gets to play Snap Path. Yeah. But I actually I actually think that like overall, like if you're trying to beat something like Scapeshift, which in my opinion is the second best deck in the format, like how do you beat Scapeshift and Death Shadow at the same time? And the the answer is probably counter spells that are pretty efficient while also removal spells that are extremely efficient, right? Because you have to be able to kill both large creatures efficiently and stop big spells efficiently. And that's true of, you know, both Gurmag Angler, Primeval Titan, 
Um, and I think that this is just a natural evolution of that. And if you want to do both really well, Spellquill actually fits into that pretty nicely. I think this deck is very tricky to play against with something like Death Shadow. I don't necessarily know that Death Shadow is, like, hugely unfavored, and I think something like Ruined Halo in the sideboard is probably a nod to both that and Valakut. Yes. But, but what I will say is that it's a kind of deck where if the Jeskai control player is the better player, it's very challenging for the Death It's very... it's. It's certainly not the kind of deck where you can just, you know, use your life total recklessly. You need to you need to be very careful about figuring out exactly, okay, so what can they draw? Because just like Bolt, Snap, Bolt with Colonnade. Is just a lot. Yeah, you can represent so much damage out of nowhere. Um, I think that, I think that also... Shadow player has to play really cautiously. I agree. I think that also when you look at a deck like this, like... This is this is a blue eye red rock deck, right? Like it's a 50-50 deck that awards you for play skill, but also awards you for understanding like what you're trying to do. Like Modern has a ton of different decks, as Michael mentioned before. So playing a 50-50 deck and then targeting specific matchups is the reason that Jun has been so successful in the history of Modern. And this deck is a great way to beat the top two decks. Like, it legitimately is. Like, if I get my ramp spell spell quellered, I'm in big trouble with the Volga deck. And if I get, uh, if I get my uh, um, uh, Coal Guns command <laughs> spell quellered, like, I'm probably going to lose with something like uh, like Death Shadow. So, um, can we uh, you had one of the biggest proponents of Jessica Control early in Modern on your previous podcast. Are you surprised to see this making a comeback? Because, like, your face says it. <laughs> I, I I am surprised. I haven't seen it around, and, and you said it was the, the biggest jumper. And uh, I'm just trying to shape in my head by looking at these lists and uh, looking at the one, the an SCG one by Benjamin Nikolich, who finished in fourth. He, he has no Geist. He opts for a three Snapcaster, one Torrential Gearhawk uh, mix as his creatures, and a one Johnny Vengeance as his Planeswalker. But he's got, you know, the four paths, like we talked about, with, along with two Supreme Verdicts, so, and three yeah, Logic so Knots. The, the, just the straight blue-white control deck had been fairly popular on Magic Online in the last month or so as well. Well, um, blue, blue-white control was actually on our last power modern powering, he's mistaken, in the top four. Yeah, so, I would think of that as more white as, like, I think... The absence of keywords and separate pipes pretty firmly. But I do think that just like the ability to play at instant speed, the ability to interact with your opponent on the stack, and have to exile uh, Thoughts or Mocking or Desetto, and then having Snapcaster for it, uh, just powerful. Yeah. I, I am surprised, think... Spencer. I, I am surprised. <laughs> cool. I, I completely agree with Michael there. Uh, it sounds like we're losing Michael a little bit here. Um, but let's let's move on to our um, our uh, second place deck, which is Titan Shift. I'm, I'm not surprised here at all. Um, KYT, you actually covered this a little bit in your last podcast or the one before it. Um, so for me... Uh, I played in one. I played in one total PPTQ since the new format started. I think it was round three of this PPTQ. I tweeted. I made a mistake. I only played two hour of promise. <laughs> and like, I was like, people were like, what do you mean? I was like, they're like, you don't like the card. I was like, no, I would have played four. I like, I definitely messed up. This deck wants four hour of promise. And uh, your your colonist actually talked about this on the podcast. Like. What is going on? Like this, this card that looks so. I, it was funny because like this card got spoiled, and people obviously, as the ramp master, have come to me asking about this card many, many times. I'm like, this is the best ramp spell printed since Primeval Titan. It, it it's not particularly close. So like KYT, like your co-host is 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 hyping this card. Like what's going on here? Yeah, I was shocked because like we were again on on the show we were talking about how. We had received this. It got spoiled too early, actually. Um, it got spoiled on the mothership before we even announced that uh, it was our GP playmat. And so I had to rush and try to hype this play uh, this playmat. But the art is just fantastic, so I didn't have to hype it up too much. But I have to talk about a bit, you know, just 
a bit during the preview post about where it might see play. And, you know, one of my colleagues like, you know, it's it's a commander staple. It's the most exciting commander card in the set. I'm like, really? And I think I just put something like that, trying to make it sound cool, but expectations were low, like as if it was a casual card. But then Brian thought he had lots of applications in standard and in modern. Oh, and this, uh, yeah, it's it's crazy to, to see that. Um, but you're not the only one. Like I'm seeing this SVG classic recently, most recent on the 13th, third place by Richard. He had two hour promises. So people are still trying to find the right mix and what to cut to fit in that place. No, it, it's, think... it's hard. It's like, how, yeah. how do I how do fit do in it? this spell that is so essential to the deck? Like, and the other thing is like, it makes me want to play more wood elves. How do I put more wood elves in to play this card? It, it's hard to figure out. The thing is, is that the fact that there's innovation on a deck that like Michael and I have been kind of touting as like one of the better decks for a long time. It's like, how do you fit in this innovation? Like, this is a real change to the deck. Michael, what are your opinions on the fact that this deck has gotten a new card and has now moved up, right? Like, it's always been like fourth, fifth on our list. Since our promise yeah. was printed, it's like, just, this is just one of the best decks. I think this deck, like, anytime you have a deck that is already good and is actually getting new cards, I mean, you look at something like Affinity, right, where it basically hasn't gotten a I don't know the last new card Affinity got, but you know you. It's you get hard to, the point to get where, new like, cards into Affinity. <laughs> right, right, but like these decks are just good, right? I think it was Titan the land, right? It was the Titan, sure, but like does Spire of Industry really make that big a difference? Probably not. It doesn't like fundamentally change anything for you. Sure. So when you're getting new cards for these decks, it's really sweet because it, it, it's a good problem to have. Basically, like this was already a great deck before, so. If, you know, if worst case scenario, you end up deciding zero is the right number, the deck's great. It's really good against right. Rix's Death Shadow with none. But it's kind of interesting to be looking at a modern deck and like, oh, man, I wonder if this card is just actually replacing some of the, like, Farseek style effects. Does this oh, card the make list Hunt only Hard Expedition? Does it, like, there are so many cards where you have to reconsider sort of a bunch of the different slots in the deck taking into account that you have this new toy to play with and it takes a long time for people to settle because i think again getting back to one of the things that people like about modern there's a lot of value with kind of staying within your comfort zone a little bit so it takes a while sometimes for really wide adoption of new cards but it's really exciting to think about just how like how a tutor that actually gets valakuts works because you know, we're playing all the primeval titans we can, but but now all of a sudden we have more. Right. There's there's another effect that's providing that kind of effect, and weighing how important it is and what it does to how you build the rest of your deck is really interesting. Yeah. You know, it was really funny when people asked me, like, oh, like you thought your deck was so great, like why didn't you win that PBT? He was like, well, I was like on the draw against Burn in the top four, and like we knew going into the matchup that like whoever was on the play was a huge favorite. Uh, Travis Padilla, former Coast of Limited Time, only one. But I knew, like, that if I had built my deck differently, I would have had a much better shot. And I think that people are legitimately trying to figure out, like, the list on our screen has three Primeval Titans. There, there are more Hour of Promise on the list on our screen than Primeval Titans. This deck is changing, and while it's changing, it's still winning. This means that as people are figuring it out, they're they're doing more and more. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people that don't like Volokit in the format. They think that it's it's actually too powerful, there's too much going on, and I think that it's actually really good for the format. I think that there are... The fact that, like, this deck exists is a showcase of the, the, the real strategy that is ramp, and I'm obviously passionate because if you look at my results, like, I play a lot of ramp decks. But um, this is the first time since this card is printed, that I'm actually like, okay, Rug is actually incorrect. I am not going to play Rug Scapeshift again because of this. Like, this this is a real thing. And yeah, uh, ability to get more Valakid seems like it really it really increases the value of all your other ramp spells. Exactly. It makes it, like, the speed of this deck that it had over the Rug deck was was already like, okay, like, which is better, right? People have tried Naya versions of this deck. People have tried Rug versions of this deck. People have tried Green Dead versions. And now that you have another way to be fast 
and like really, really fast, it makes it kind of ridiculous to play the other versions of the deck. Um, and also like the fact that you're that you're it doesn't actually matter which shadow matchup, right? Like all of your shadow matchups are great, whether it's Grixis, whether it's Esper, whether it's Jund, like your shadow matchup is really, really good. And it's the reason this deck is, keeps climbing. Yeah, I'm kind of fascinated to see. It looks like uh, this list is playing, what, three Colony Heart Expedition? But Colony Heart Expedition specifically is a card that seems, you know, borderline insane with Hour of Promise, right? Like being able to get two triggers off the two Valakids. Oh, yeah, you, like, drive your Valakids, like, and then you they die. They're, they're just dead. Or it's, yeah. like, you know, Plague Wind, one or the other, right? I mean, yeah. if you want and to look at you, why it, the Death Shadow matchup is good, like... It's because yeah. when your opponent keeps going to eight life and you're just like, okay, I kill you. Yeah. Right. Yep. It's, it's, uh, it's too much. KYT, any thoughts? <laughs> Sorry, my <laughs> monitor's just beyond me at this point. <laughs> you, you played a lot actually against the, um, the original Volokut lists, right? Like when you started the A team, um, green, red of Volokut was the best deck in standard. Are you surprised to see cards like Colony Heart Expedition and Valakut becoming such huge role players in Modern? Um, no, because Valakut was just an, an absurdly powerful card. And, and when I first played against Skate Chip and lost to it, playing like I usually played Rock decks at the time and just like discarding their hand and, and losing to the, the old top deck Skate Chip one too many times, it just felt really powerful. It just... They just need to hit uh, seven or eight lands, and then any card that they rip from the top was was a real scare, especially since I'm playing, like, black-based this card, and I can't do anything at that point. So yeah. it just seems really powerful to just go, oh, I win. Or then, um, more frustrating when you do discard their cards, but then they played, they could play, like, rug versions, where they could Snapcaster it back, and now they have additional outs uh, off the top. So that gives yeah. them a lot of percentage points in those top deck wars. So I'm not surprised. And uh, looking forward to picking that deck up. That's the one deck I want to actually pick up and and try mess around with the uh, Hour of Promise numbers to see what I come up with. Sure. Coming up next with 35 points, we have Grixis Death Shadow. Uh, we Everybody knows this is the best deck, Michael. Everybody knows this is the best deck, KYT. Like, how... Is it is it getting its number from volume, or is it getting its number from just being the best deck? We'll start with you, KYT. Um, is it is it performing that well? Like it's it's not near the top of your list anymore in your power rankings. No, it is. It is number one. Okay. Okay. You're going backwards. My yes. Back. It, this is number one. <laughs> this is number one. It comes oh, in with thirty five points. Number one. But I, I I'm just surprised though uh, in a lot of areas where. Um, I guess for me, just people decide, I, I think it's really that good because a lot of people decide not to play it in my experience, like in Halifax, it did not make a showing, uh, in the top eight. And, um, you know, my friend, uh, Justin Richardson actually, uh, had, I think he went X1 at Syracuse playing Grix's Death Shadow. And I don't think he, he ran into too many mirrors. Uh, my friend Andy, who top 10, finished 10th, I think, at Syracuse as well, played Affinity, didn't run into it that much, so I just feel like people are not, in modern, they're just used to their own deck, they're not playing the best decks. I don't think it's as numerous. Uh, that's my impression, based okay. on no real data, and it's just people uh, performing really well, the people that do play it performing really well. So the list on our screen, I'm kind of looking at it right now, and looking at the, this is the best Grixis Shadow list I've ever seen. Like, I, I actually would consider jumping off of Scape Shift to play this list. Like, I... Are they, I, are they playing one Liliana? Is that the... No, they're... I saw uh, a bunch of lists. Yeah, so there's one Liliana on the board, but there is... Uh, so it's... Just just kind of read it really quick. It's four Death Shadow, four Snap, uh, four Street Wraith, four Gurmag Angler... Uh, sorry, uh, two Gurmag... Well, four, two, two, four two, yeah, yeah four, four Delph yeah. creatures. Uh, four Fatal Push, uh, three... Stubborn Denial, one Sleight of Hand, four uh, Thought Scour, two Terminate, two Inquisition, uh, four Serum Visions, four Thought Seize, two uh, uh, Colgon's Command, and then we have uh, 18, 18 lands. 
Okay, yep. so basically from the stock list, he's down a land and up a sleight of hand. Yeah, and uh, I I really like that change. I don't know what it is about that change. And then he's got the team of battle rages in the sideboard, literally on the sideboard, the fourth uh, uh, stubborn eye on the sideboard. Like the <laughs> the I, I might actually play another ceremonious rejection in the board in this in this meta, but uh, man. Like what is what is going on in here, Michael? Like what are they are I they think, figuring out how to beat this meta still? I think this deck just it, it feels a lot like Legacy Delver. Like you just have all of these you have all of this card selection and then your best hands just feel really unfair. Mm-hmm. So you're almost like an you you you're like an aggro control deck. You know, you're kind of you're you're doing these delver things. And then your your best draws are just like oppressively fast death shadows backed with a bunch of thought seizes. Cool. So I, I think the combination of really interactive, drawn out games that just favor the better player and really uninteractive, very short games where you know you play a three three on turn one that's a seven seven on turn two and you know they get thought seized three times in that span or whatever. I think that like the mix of those two things just makes this deck really appealing. Yeah, I, I think that this deck has continued to innovate in small ways into those flex slots that like just become so valuable. I think those flex slots really matter. So let's actually move on though. I think that uh, we've talked about the top decks to prepare for at Modern. These are the decks that like you really need to understand. There's no deck of the week this week. We wanted to give KYT the time he deserves as our guest. And we want to talk about the power of magic content. So let's actually move on right into our training grounds. Um, we've gone over on most of our segments this week, so I wanted to give KYT the time he deserves. Um, so we've already talked about this a little bit, KYT, but I want to talk about the origins of Mana Deprived. And um, I think one of the nicest things that's ever happened in my magic life is KYT wrote an article where he talked about the Utah Invitational Series. And he talked about the things that I was trying to do to to, like... I don't Inspired. remember this. You don't remember this? <laughs> you don't have to remember it. It was a big deal to me. That's what's important. Uh, so I did, I created a series in Utah um, where people got points according to their finish. They qualified for a qualifying tournament that was like this invitational. And uh, KYT kind of talked about it in one of his, his articles uh, on Man Deprived. And it, it's so funny that he did that because when I, when I started – the Utah Invitational, it was like, how how do I help Utah the way that KYT has helped Canada? So then he went and, like, mentioned my series in an article on his website about Canadian magic. It was a pretty big deal to me. Um, KYT, what, what, is, what is it about Canada that you find so dear? And what is it about Man Deprived that, like, helped launch these these new people, like people have moved to Canada because of Canadian magic. They're like we've lost great American players to you guys. Like, what's going on? I think, I think Jacob Wilson only did it for school. So we stole one of your best uh, for school reasons. And I think he's probably back in Vegas being like a professional poker player or something. Cause he's, he played the, the main event. Um, Canada's just, uh, it's, I mean, I was born here. I know, have not traveled too much. Uh, I've only been to Utah once, right? I've only seen you <laughs> for that GP where nobody showed up for whatever reason. The attendance was very yeah. low. Um, hey, I but cashed I had a great GP, time. Bro. I cashed that GP. That <laughs> was the best moment. <laughs> He's not going to win. <laughs> just some guy just said, like, good luck. Good luck, Spencer. And you're like, good luck. Yeah, let's let's... Yeah, my my I lost to a turn to what's the one that turns your artifact into a five five? Uh, uh, and soul artifact. Yeah, so he was like turn one island, turn two uh, dark steel citadel, uh, make it a five five go. And I was like, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then I lost. And then like KYT and I were walking past. He's like, hey, did you win your next round? And I was like, yeah, I did. And he's like, oh, I lost. And I was like, okay. He's like, yeah, good luck. And I was like, good luck to you too. And then Carrie T's like, he's not going to win, brah. He's not going to win. <laughs> I think he's not going to make it, is what I'm saying. He's not going to make it, is what you said. Yeah. That's right. But um, but no, I, I think that I think that um, Canada has this tight-knit community 
that you have helped create in Magic. Is that is that something that was your goal when you started Mana Deprived? It was not. I guess it just came uh, snowballed. Um, always want to make sure I take less credit because uh, what I've what I've what's been written about what I've done is probably way too uh, big than than what I actually did. Uh, I think and what I really wanted to do was. I felt there were no, everyone knew the problem I saw was that I think the mothership was the only way at the point, at that point to see who the good players were. I just felt like, you know, chess had more coverage. I always bring it back to chess because that's where it came from. Like I knew who the top 10 players are. I knew who to go for maybe advice or just who the personalities are. Like you just knew who the good American players were and possibly the Japanese players. Uh, who, who the good ones like Kenji uh, Samura? He probably had LSV at the time. Gabriel Nassif, like all those players, but no one had a clue about who the good Canadian players were, except like maybe Gary Wise, but like he's because he's a Hall of Famer, and but he has retired years ago. And Rich Hohen, sort of, because he he wrote for SCG and was considered one of the best, and still is one of the best drafters in the world. But you didn't really know much else and of course since then lots of change now you know who alexander hayne is you know who pascal maynard is like people that have contributed to, to man and help contribute to man deprived uh seven years ago like these people helped uh make it what it is and now you're finally knowing and well it's been a while since you know who these people are where dan lantier sammy t all these top Canadian players. And so for me, it was important to just get these names out there, post um, results or, or top results, but not just top results of important tournaments, but exactly who won and, and who these people were, just so that people that were following the game from, um, I guess, a more spectator standpoint could could just like follow along. Okay, this guy's like been the top player for a while now. So to know who to cheer for outside of the of the usual people that people knew uh, in in the U.S. When you let's be blatantly honest, when you look at like the the success of Man Deprived, there are a few things that stand out, and the A team is definitely one of them. Like it is, it's probably the second most successful Magic the Gathering podcast ever. Like listeners is like. If you look at listeners, it is it is number two. It's I don't even think it's close. Like it's everybody listened, everybody. If you were a Magic player on Twitter, you listened to the A team. If you were a Magic player that did well at an event, you were probably on the A team. And uh, you know, if you listen to constructive criticism, which you probably are right now, or you're, or if you listen to any of the new Magic Gathering podcasts, it was probably influenced by the A team. What? Who let's be let's be clear. Who was the target audience of the A team? Um I don't the original target audience was just Canadian players. Again, I was my main focus at the time, obviously it didn't play out that way, was to focus on Canadian content, get Canadian personalities known, and talk about Canadian events because like, I don't know anything else at the time more than other people. It's not like I'm going to talk about high-level magic more than LSV or whoever. I'm not going to do that. What I can do is is give my Canadian unique Canadian spin on it, and, and that was the goal. And I got two Canadians and a random American. Oh, I don't know best. why. The best. Uh, the best, apparently, uh, J- Jesse Smith, uh, to be on the show. But, but usually who I wanted to pick for the show, I think it's one of your later questions, but uh, it's people that I think will stick for the long run because consistent content production and the willingness to continue to do something with minimal feedback at the beginning, like knowing that if you put out good stuff, eventually someone will come check it out. You need that. And with Jesse starting his own site, 60cards.com, which is now defunct, but he started it. He pushed articles. It's actually a virus. Trying- please, please don't go to 60cards.com. You actually, <laughs> it will actually automatically download a virus onto your computer. I, I think so at this point. But seeing someone else that was basically the clone of me in a way because he was pushing – he was like you also. He was like all of us pushing out content 
articles, making videos. He was trying to do everything. And I saw that passion, similar passion. So I had to put him, get him on board. And that's why we were able to do 50 episodes together. Because you need people like that that are willing to stick it out for the long run, regardless of how, you know, maybe you get one listener the first time, but just being able to have that uh, long-term vision. You know, one of the biggest criticisms of constructive criticism is that we rotate through hosts, right? Like people are like, Spencer, why can't you get a host? Like, why does everybody hate you? And uh, for those who don't know, Manny, (laughs) Quentin, Matthew, Kling, and Casey were actually all of my groomsmen. Um, These are my best friends. Like they, they're like literally. I don't know, man. I don't know if that's true. No, they are. They're my best friends. <laughs> um, uh, and the only person that didn't actually last fifty episodes is actually Manny. And I think what KYT is saying is right. Like, uh, doing doing a podcast every week is like such a big commitment because you there's nothing that Mike like we plan our weeks around this podcast. It's like K like. What do we do? Like, yeah, this, yeah. this is the thing that's happening. That is the best so, like, question. So it's like, okay, well, like, this thing came up. So, like, now we have to rearrange our entire lives around this one thing that's happening in our lives. And the A-Team did it for 300 episodes. 300. And it, when you listen to some of, like, the greatest Magic the Gathering podcasts, they, they all are inspired by uh, the A-Team – Limited resources and probably um, Yo and Two G Taps are probably like the three ones that are like, and, and all, probably Monday Night Magic and uh, the Mana Pool are like the other ones, like right, like the, they're just probably the big five, like the the five Magic the Gathering. Right, well, I, we have to say Top Eight Magic or else. Uh, you know. uh sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. That's a basketball podcast, right? <laughs> they were probably the original one, like either them or UMTG. Is Thompson. it a basketball podcast? Is it a uh, uh, jackhammer podcast? <laughs> what is that? Podcast? I don't know, but it was one of the <laughs> grandfathers for sure. Sure, but but I think that what's important is like you have to recognize that the things that you probably love today are influenced by other Magic the Gathering content, and the thing like when you look. So um, I, I'll just say this now. When you look at Cedric and P. Sully, right? Like, what makes Cedric and P. Sully great? They're the best duo to ever do commentary in Magic the Gathering. Can I, I, I actually don't think that if Patrick Chapin ever took the booth and the, brought, hit what he brought to the booth, that P. Sully would have been as good as he was. Like, there people before those people brought what they thought was great, and it made those that came after them better. And... I think that the 18 did a lot of that for podcasting and I wanted to bring KYT on to say thank you um, as both of my pod, well, both of my first two podcasts have been greatly influenced by your content and I really appreciate it. Let's, let's, let's move on to the power of magic content overall though. We've, we've uh, built up KYT and now it's time for everybody to talk. Um, So let's, let's start with this thing. So we'll actually start with you, KYT. You've now moved on to uh, (laughs) – I'm laughing at your co-host in the chat. He says he can see your head getting bigger. (laughs) But um, I want to start with, like, why why choose spiky content? Why why pick the best players to come on the A team? And why why first strike? Like, why this spiky content for you? Like, why even, like, get the guests on, uh, no, on the yeah, What's the point of spikes? Like, why spikes over other content? I think in retrospect, it's a big mistake. And uh, we should just, uh, <laughs> I think you got to yep. figure out, you got to scrap the show and uh, come up <laughs> with an EDH show. I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> I... sure that's the way to go. Um, I'm sorry to come on this episode. I actually the only one to vote in your poll to just let the show die, I think. Um, but I think at the time, uh, bringing Spikes on, on the show, bringing the A-Team was just hoping to draw more people in. They're just the main stars of the game. So I'm surprised. Not Actually, maybe not, because for them, they, they also like, I imagine a lot of them appreciate the attention uh, they're getting 
uh, when they do on an event and they come on our show that has like a solid listenership, though, though I really doubt they knew how solid that was. But it was just to draw people in, whether it's we had Raptor, we had we had Paul Cheon, we had Conley Woods, we had Owen Turtenwald even. Um, it's kind of crazy because our oh, show... The, the Tom Martell episode was the best. Tom Martell, we had... Our show was allowed swearing, but we had some of, if not like many of the biggest names of Magic on that show. So it was just to attract people and I think take it to a different direction. Sort of like, I think I got inspired by just regular talk shows and how they brought on celebrity guests that, wow, I, I'm interested to know. And, and sometimes I personally was interested to know how those pros got to that level because at that point, before making the Pro Tour twice, I had never made the, come close to making the Pro Tour. It's just like, how do you even get there, right? How do you even get there? And this was also during the time before one of my closest friends, Alex, went on to win Pro Tour, uh, Avison, Avison Restored. Like, I didn't know the steps that it took to get there. So having them answer the questions, not just for our fans, but for myself, uh, was important. And as for picking my hosts, for first strike, I think most importantly they had to be entertaining, um, and that's what Rob is is mainly for, Mr. Lombardi. Only oh, entertainment. Oh, he's only entertainment. Yeah, zero percent daggers. Incidentally, daggers. like it just happened that he he was good at magic, but mainly for for the lulls and uh, because we were gonna analyze stuff. The problem I, I wanted to differentiate us from the current. Um, there's a bunch of different shows right now that talk about topics that are more for the casual crowd, whether it's, uh, but they're doing awesome content by casual. I don't really mean that to say that they're worse than us. They're just catering to a different, um, audience. Like they're debating whether let's say commander 2017 is a good set or not for the commander crowd. That's not something that I know from a competitive standpoint, but we're talking about like the mana source, Talarian Community College, these people that I really respect for, for their content creation or, or magic mics. So I'm like, I don't want to be like that to, to just come from a uh, the same level of understanding uh, competitively. So I wanted to have a different feel and, and it like the advice and the opinion is coming from people who are actively playing at the highest level. Like Robert just made was GP champion last year. He just recently made top eight a couple of months ago. Brian Godley was really close, was two win and away win and in a ways from top eighting a pro tour. And I myself have, have at least like Q for two PTs and have been friends with some of the best in the world. So we have that perspective. You're back, versus, Michael, in case you're wondering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> versus like people that are just attacking other topics that are more uh, for the casual audience. Yeah, I I think that you did a really good job. Like when I, uh, if it, it's so funny that people ask me all the time, they're like, Spencer, what would you change about Conjecture Critics? I'm like, I would have started a new podcast at like episode 100. Like I would have started a whole new show. Like what do you mean? I'm like, I learned too much. Like after that first hundred episodes plus the whatever I did of brain tapped, like I just know way more. I would have just done a new show. I would have started over. But, like, but why? I'm like. KYT did a really good job with First Strike. Like, he knew who he wanted. He knew what he wanted. And the show's better because of it. And um, I probably I probably would have started the show over with, with Michael and Quentin. Like, that, that would be my co-hosts. And uh, that's nothing against Casey and Manny and Matthew, by the way. They're <laughs> all amazing. That's a lot amazing. of people. That's a lot that, of people. They're all amazing. But, like... I think that you know what the show that you're doing is looking for. And the reason that like I chose spiky content is this the thing that resonates with me. Like when I started constructive criticism, there was there were if I wanted to listen to a spiky podcast, I had to listen to like Glory Seekers, which was basically a legacy podcast. Like let's be honest. Like it was this podcast that was like basically legacy content. It was these SEG grinders that only talked about like five minutes of standard and then you know, the rest of it was legacy or I had to like listen to like 10 minutes of the A team where KYT talked like that was it. That was like the spiky content that was available to me since I've started the show, like tons of other shows have come out. But for me, it was always like, well, it's not fair that I don't get to listen to things that like 
apply to a PTQ grinder. Like, I want to get better at Magic the Gathering. And it's like, okay, well, like, I top eight a lot of PTQs. Like, I've I've done what I can. And for me, it's always been a journey. It's like, what can I do to get better every week? And how can I share that with the people that also want to get better every week? Um, and, you know, through this, you've watched um, me qualify for a Pro Tour, Casey qualify for a Pro Tour, um, Quentin qualify for multiple Pro Tours, Michael qualify for multiple Pro Tours. And you've got to watch that journey on our podcast. And that's why I chose Becky content is so that you could come with us on this journey of always improving. But Michael, you're, this is your magic content. Like this is the thing that you do. You're different than KYT and I like, why this, like, why is this your content? Um, I think it's about like, for me, it's about making content that I believe I can make. Right. I mean, there are lots of things I certainly wouldn't want to listen to me talk about. Right. I sure. mean, there, there are lots of shows you could put me on where I'm sure I would be absolutely terrible. Even okay. magic related shows that I would be terrible sure. on, but it's something where I feel like hopefully what I'm saying has value. And it's something that whether it has value or not, I'm certainly saying what I believe to be true. KYT, when it comes to the creators you look up to, like, obviously there's Mike Flores. Like, he's he's your sensei, <laughs> as you call him. But yeah. is, there, is there any other content creators that you, like, look at and you're like, I want I want to create content like them. Um, right now, like I'm just really I just in terms of because there's a lot of people I wish I had the resources to know how to do that type of stuff, which is the YouTube stuff. That oh, the YouTube stuff gained, is hard, dude. That has gained a lot of traction. Whether it's yeah. like again, Tolarian uh, Community College, Mana Source, uh, the Commander. Uh, guys, um, they're just killing it, and they just put a lot of work into like their intro, the music, the the different type of like slideshow type stuff. So that I'm just amazed. And, and even before that, I think it was um, Gathering Magic had a series called was it called Inside the Deck or something like that. They they had just that space is um, very interesting to me. That is content that i wish i could just do on a regular basis somehow just traveling to an event and having sort of this vlog type thing uh, interspersed with like interviews i think that would be awesome but for like spiky type of content no no not not really honestly because there's a lot of players that uh i get to write articles with that i'm frankly just impressed i uh, usually i'm just people who know their deck and when you read their piece and, and you can understand basically you, you, you won't know because you, ha you don't have any reps in but to be able to like really really understand a deck just to be able to read after reading someone's article on let's say Eldrazi Tron and how they would try to plan against certain decks and sideboard after the fact um, there's a lot of pieces specific pieces where I would be like wow this was really well written and in depth it didn't look like they were phoning it in like I felt even like I like Jerry Thompson. Remember when he was doing like deck of the day on SCG? Yeah. And I just didn't think that I don't didn't add anything like stuff like that. Or even Eric Froelich's deck of the week. It's just it's not for me. It's just really OK. This is just a deck I didn't talk about before. And here's a few lines. So. Many, many writers I've looked up to, uh, but no, no one specific that have like had hit after hit after hit. It's usually a lot of different people just writing a piece that I'm like, wow, that's pretty awesome. Mike, what are you? Like when you look at content creators, is there somebody that like when you read an article, you're like, man, I really want to talk about this on my podcast. I really want to help people understand what this person understands. Well, I think... When I think through, like, the writers where I guess what they say resonates most with me, the people I feel most on the same wavelength to with, like, when they write an article about what they're thinking about for Standard this week, and you're like, okay, yeah, I just, that's sort of the same place I was getting to. Jerry Thompson really does that for me a lot. I agree that, like, I think 
the deck of the day slash deck of the week style articles where, you know, where they're putting them on the free side and just using them to try to sell cards or whatever. I mean, I think those articles are just inherently going to be bad no matter who writes them. But in his work as a columnist and just in listening to him, like watching him stream and listening to what he has to say, it just what he says really resonates with me for whatever reason. Uh, so I, and one of the things I really enjoy is that he never comes off as anything other than like, this is what I think. Yeah. I, I can't, I can't tell you emphatically that this is a hundred percent true when I know it and I know it because I'm better than you. He will just say, this is what I think. And I, I don't know that that resonates with me. I, I can completely understand that. Um, I think that's why, why I started this show. And, um, when I look at like the, the content that I can, that I look up to the creators that I look up to, I, I have mentioned KYT and Marshall as like the podcasters that I'm like, okay, like guys, I need help understanding like this thing that I'm doing. Like I, I, I'm sure KYT has been in more threads with Marshall with me than with But like, I really do look up to those two as as these people that like are the like to me the, like the podcasting godfathers. And um, when I look at other content, um, you know, I I think that I think that um, just, despite what KYT made, I think there's a real opening for spy content on YouTube, like specifically like extremely hardcore spy content. And I, I don't I don't have somebody to look up to there. But I do have somewhere to look up to in other places, like um, the fact that Michael Majors and Jerry were so open on their podcast about like exactly what they were thinking. That's that's where I want to be with my content. Like I want to be like, okay, this is this is literally what I'm thinking. Like you can either listen to me or think I'm wrong, but like this is the thing that I want to communicate to you as a creator. And I just want to be honest. Like what? How how many people are gonna listen? Like. Let, let's pretend it's 10,000, right? Like, let's pretend like 10,000 people hear my content. Right, KYT's throwing up a zero, right? But like, does in the grand scheme of things, do those 10,000 people matter? No, there's millions of Magic players. So I just want to just be honest. And I, all of the content creators that are truly honest about their content, those are the people that I look up to. Um, let's, let's talk about... Uh, let, let me just jump in real quick, oh, sure. uh, Spencer, about... The I, I was like sort of half joking, really joking about the going casual and EDH route. What? But uh, the serious realization that I've made only this year is that I seriously underestimated. I mean, I, I hear it all the time. Like competitive players don't buy cards, magic cards. It's like the casual cards that are the casual players are the ones that you're making the most money off of when it comes to like, let's say you're a card store. They're the ones buying the most cards. And they're also like the biggest magic content um, consumers. Like when me and you talk privately about certain channels that we can't believe are this popular, it's just <laughs> like, but it's true. It's just the sudden realization that when you go to Reddit, right? When, when Commander 2017, 2017 was being spoiled, it's just super passionate about that versus like any competitive thing. Sure. It's like, all the C17 singles uh, spoiled. They're like they're like upvoted like crazy, and I think that I personally didn't realize that. I didn't personally realize that the competitive space versus the casual space was like the gap was that big. Yeah, it was really that big. But that's not that doesn't mean that you shouldn't come up with a competitive product. Like for me, just having the number of first strike Patreon patrons that I have now is just like crazy. So, but I didn't realize it before when I started the website, if my only goal was to get like hits, get views, then I shouldn't have gone the competitive route. Basically, I should have found a way to try to come up with more casual friendly content. But of course, that's not the way I went. But uh, it took me years to realize that that there's a huge audience out there. And again, like those videos that we see on, on YouTube, we're just like, I don't get it. Like we don't get it. We don't get why they're that popular, but they are. They are ten times more, a hundred times more popular than if we would have like predicted how many views they got, right? So yeah, 
and I think that's all true, but at the same time, when when you yourself don't feel like you're part of the audience you're trying to produce content for, it's so hard to like, I mean, how, how do you know what appeals to casual players, right? I mean, if you're not a casual player yourself, it's so hard to understand what gets them excited, what they're looking for in yeah. videos and cards and content. So it kind of goes both ways, right? I mean, it, it's really hard to produce content that isn't genuine just because it's going to be crappy. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go pretty deep here. Um, oh God. I, I didn't no, know. I'm not ready. I'm not ready for this. <laughs> so I had ready. a meeting. I had a meeting with uh, Danny Cathro, my co-host on Limited Time Only, and we sat down in my living room and we actually wrote down like our target listeners, and it's so like we wrote down the type of Magic players that would either listen to our content or that we wanted to target, and you know I I think that uh, in product management the the like my job in my day to day personas are pretty important. So like. A persona is a person that is going to use your application. So I, I build apps for a living, or I actually don't build them. I actually tell people what to build, and then they build them. Um, I, I and and uh, you know in in my business, like building a persona, like a, a user is pretty important. So um, for magic content, there are there are pretty clear identified personas that Wizards has already created for you, right? But within those personas, I think there's even more, right? Somebody might be a Johnny Spike or a Timmy Spike or, uh, you know, just like a, a regular Spike versus like a, a a Pro Tour Spike, right? Like there are so many um, personas within personas in Magic content that what Michael's saying and what KYT is saying is true. I think that like um, when you're consuming Magic content or when you're creating Magic t- content, a huge part of that is like understanding what am, what do I want my listener to get from this? And one of the reasons that I think that our podcast has resonated with people so well is that we want you to not only get better at magic, but we want you to apply the lessons that we teach on this podcast into your regular life. Like um, I think Brian on your podcast this week talked about how magic um, for him has always been a direct comparison to his real life. Like he can apply the lessons he learns and get better at other things in life. And that has been very true for me. And I think that's always been the point of constructive criticism. Um, and knowing who you're targeting with your content just makes your content better. Because if you target too many people, your content suffers. Like, it gets so much worse if you're, like, trying to make so many more people happy. And I understand that, like, uh, certain player bases aren't going to like me because I'm going to I'm gonna see call it as I see it as, like, I want to qualify for the Pro Tour and I want to help my listeners qualify for the Pro Tour. And uh, there's going to be some number of people that are, like, but you called my my deck that like that went two one at F and I'm really bad. I'm like, yeah, because like <laughs> you're never gonna qualify for the Pro Tour with it. Wow. And, and and that's okay to me as a content creator. Like I'm okay with that. But I also know that there are a lot of people who understand why I call that deck bad, and they appreciate the fact that I'm honest and open and that I am willing to give constructive criticism. And still accept the fact that like their goals might be different than mine, but they can still apply what I'm saying to try and make them better at magic. And I think that that is very different than a content channel that's specifically dedicated to a player that just wants to have fun and be entertained. It, it's it's a little bit different. I, I just want to finish oh, like, before we move on that I agree with my, Michael completely. I've played maybe five games of Commander in my life, maybe. Just because it's like I was at Scotty Mac's house and everyone's playing, hey, join this multiplayer game, okay? And uh, so I wouldn't be able to create content from that space at all. But yeah. it's just right. I, I completely underestimate. Like I'm always trying to do things that I think would get more views, like that I think is really gold content and really key to competitive players. Um, but then when it doesn't get the views it gets versus other things, it's like, wow, I, I've overestimated the amount of people who would be interested in this type of stuff. Is uh, Yeah. Is, I, I, when you're friends, right, you meet your friends through playing magic tournaments and, you know, you you get wrapped up in in the world of people that play competitive magic. It's it's hard not to, uh, to overestimate a little bit sometimes. I certainly understand. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's... Uh... Let's talk about us really quick. So, Michael, I'm actually interested uh, for your answer as somebody who used to listen to this podcast before you were a co-host. 
what is the magic content that you consume today? Um, I'm pretty sporadic in consuming magic content. I mostly will watch people stream. Um, but what, what I'm looking for in content is just information from sources that, you know, I find trustworthy and just honesty from them. Right. I mean, and I think that's one of the reasons I like streaming. It's very easy to like evaluate sort of what's happening in front of you. Um, but it's also one of the reasons that like a lot of the, that I'm fairly happy to read like an article by Brad or Jerry, just because I, I feel like, you know, they certainly might be wrong sometimes, but they're not lying to you. They'll, they'll, you know, say what they think is good and you do with that information what you what you will. But I, I think that that's kind of the most important thing, pretty much always, just that you can trust the information you're being given. Yeah, for me, it's it's pretty similar. So uh, I am mostly a podcast listener. Um, and then I also have an app called Audiofy on my iPhone that allows me to download magic content, uh, that an article form into audio form. So I can... Uh, take an article and then just turn it into a podcast, basically. Um, so I do that a lot too. But basically, I listen to First Strike, uh, Limited Resources, the Game Podcast, um, and then some amount of top level are like probably my go-to's. Uh, and basically, that's it. And then uh, articles that people recommend to me that I turn into Audiofy. And the thing that's important to me is the basically people being true like they're this is what they think and i think that's the reason that like first strike in game and limited resources speak to me so well is that uh when when robert says something on first strike he probably really thinks it like he's probably not just gonna like take the wrong there's no just, on this show yeah exactly <laughs> despite what the podcast is named after right. there's no skip bayless for real and and i think that that's really important to me. And I, man, like, uh, Brian is a superstar for being able to do both of those podcasts, but Michael majors was, um, it, it's kind of sad to see him leave that show because I think he was like a once in a lifetime talent as far as like both being able to play magic and talk about magic. Um, but the game, the game podcast is, is another one that I really appreciate. Um, people will hate me for saying this, but I, I like my favorite episodes of limited resources were the John episodes and the, um, Oh man, I can't remember his third co-host's name. Uh, Brian, I think it was all, I also wanted to say Brian, but I didn't want to get it wrong. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was Brian. Um, those, those episodes were, um, really helped me improve at magic the gathering. And while LSV is extremely great, um, and I still love the show. Like, I, I will actually go back and listen to some old episodes of limited resources to like understand magic theory in a way that has not been taught before and uh, probably won't be taught again. And uh, that's, that's kind of something that I really appreciate is like content that is dedicated to real improvement. Uh, your, your co-host is that Brian Wong ruined limited magic for everybody. KYT. So I don't know what he means by that, but I thought that the Quadrant Theory episode was like literally the best podcast I've ever listened to. So, but KYD, what is what is the magic content that you consume? Well, I'm surprised he said that. I'd have to I'd have to go back to listen to these Brian Wong episodes because he's not really outside of the stat podcast sphere. He's not really that known. Um, me, I just actually don't consume that much uh, MTG podcast just because probably because of work and I'm just magic all the way up to the top but sometimes i'll check out this show the game podcast and top eight magic these are the three shows that i will top level in. right uh it's actually the jackhammer show oh uh, really yeah i need the I need, I need bdm bdm i just want them to talk about other stuff that's so like, funny to me yeah yeah i don't need the i don't need the high level content and because they also aren't playing actively so i'm not really getting the the I'm not getting to, up to the minute tech from them, right? Yeah. I am getting that from Jerry Thompson. I'm not getting it from Patrick Chapin, who only probably plays Pro Tours at this point. 
And uh, of course, a lot of people think that Mike Flores, well, have thought for a long time that his prime is uh, woo, well long gone. And, and you're probably one of the first, you probably thought that seven years ago. Um, <laughs> hey, I Like I said before, I love Mike, so I won't. <laughs> I don't know. I, I've, I think I've, it's funny that I'm his Padawan. I've trashed him a number of times on the A-team, and I know he actively listened for a long time. And he also listened to First Strike. So I never know why he's uh, never really called me out on uh, making fun of him. But uh, those are the type of stuff. And then the really good articles that uh, are pretty rare. Like recently on MTG Mint Card, which is probably a strategy site that not a lot of people know actually exists, is um, they came out with, for people playing standard, uh, there's just people from that team, from the Pro Tour, that came out with a good Zombies article and a good Teamer Energy article with Cyborging Guide and the reasons behind the Cyborging Guide and what cards to look after post-Cyborg. So, like, those are the ones that really appeal to me. And, of course, Jerry is known to be my hero. So when he, whenever he puts out, like, solid uh, an article, that's definitely one I will always try to check out. Um, and I don't believe that Cyborging guys are actually a crutch. Sometimes people don't really have time to prepare for an event. And oh man, just, is that a shot fired at me right now? <laughs> it might be. Like some people say that. <laughs> I feel like some people it is sort of a crutch, but then some some authors take it too far, and it's like their their excuse for being lazy or they don't actually know how to cyborg. So they're just like, well, cyborging can just depend on anything, and then I yeah, specifically submit. said I specifically said in that video that if you know how to play Magic the Gathering it can be useful to you. Like, if you're, like, good enough to be on a Pro Tour already, it's probably useful content for you. But if you're not good enough to actually have already qualified for a Pro Tour, then a sideboarding guide is probably not good for you. You actually might want to write your own first. I think the ones that are good, so the ones that are on MTG Mint Card, let's say, they'll add actually a few lines to elaborate. So, like, sometimes you have to know, like, the reason why a deck might take out Avacyn or Glorybringer because the other deck is playing Grass of Darkness. So stuff like that. Like, if you don't put that explanation, people will just follow the guide and not do that and not know it's a tempo blowout. But once, like, an author just puts a little line of, oh, you probably want to side these out because they're bad because of Grasp and other instant removal spells that they may have that are cheap, then you learn a lot about how the matchup would play out and, and the reason why you're sideboarding. So... I think that uh, that's why, and so I try not to to do much to consume too much content. And of course, the videos, whether it's like a draft or a deck tech, uh, like someone just playing a league, the problem with that is like it, it's good, it's entertaining, but I don't think it's doing the best with the time I have to teach me how to draft a format. I need, I'd rather a primer than like just a league, right? Is what no, I, that, I makes, that makes a lot of sense. When you're working with limited time, you need to maximize what you're getting out of it. Um, and getting, being like more efficient matters more than getting the absolute maximum possible. Right. Like I kind of appreciate it. Let's say when SCG do, does those versus series, right? Just to see how they think a matchup will play out and how they would sideboard sure. their decks. So that's sure. like, whoa, that's that's very useful. And and a guy like jumping in a random league playing against random decks it, it's cool just to see how the deck plays out but if i want like really solid info then i would just go another way and so that's the type of content that i gravitate towards and of course entertaining videos i've never been a fan of of the sketch comedy that uh, wizards like the mothership loves a lot like friday i just never got that and i laugh at everything sure. spencer you I do laugh. you laugh at a lot of stuff I laugh. I laugh at everything, and I just don't find it very funny. I just don't get it. <laughs> that that lady tried to pull out of that Taylor Swift concert was, like, the funniest thing in the world to you. <laughs> yeah, anything is funny to me, but I just don't get it. And, and they're, but, but, you know, I'm not going to hate on them. Uh, they're obviously clearly doing great things, so. Yeah, I would be uh, offended at myself if I didn't mention Paulo, by the way. Like, I, felt, I thought somebody else would mention him, and uh, I, I didn't want to be, like, Everybody knows that I'm like the biggest Paulo fan in the world. Like Paulo, I have Paulo signed tokens in my house. Like, 
I've had Paulo on every bit of magic content I've ever created. Like everybody knows that I love Paulo, but I actually believe he's the best magic writer of all time. I believe that one day he'll go down as the best magic player of all time. And um, if you're looking to improve Magic the Gathering, um, just consume all of his content. Like he's he's unreal, and uh, he everything he does is better than anything that I'll ever produce. So like you should definitely check him out. So uh, <laughs> first of all, I want to. Uh, apologize that Mason spelled your name wrong uh, this entire show. KYT. <laughs> so I, didn't good. Even, I didn't even look. I didn't even look. Um, so <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I apologize. Um, all right. But uh, let's, let's wrap this up. And, you know, when we talk about magic content, right? Like that's, that's obviously what this training has been about. Like, what do we listen to? What do we like? What do we want to get from it? But but I want to know, what do you hope your listeners get um, from your content? And we'll, we'll, we're going to start with you, um, Michael. We're actually going in reverse order. Michael, what do, you, what do you hope that listeners get from it? I hope that they understand that I'm trying my best. Sometimes my best is, you know, not as good as I wish it was, but you are absolutely getting my actual thoughts for better or worse. Yeah. I, 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 um, I appreciate that. That's why I like you as a co-host. <laughs> KYT, what do you, when somebody listens to first strike or somebody reads an article you put out or watches a video, like what are you hoping that they get? Something that they could actually apply to uh, their own game. I, I feel like a lot of people just, the pro like I see this a lot. I just feel, and I'm sure you and, and Michael see this a lot in your local community. I think that people just, for the most part, 95% of the people I see stay in the same tier of player that they that they have been since I met them seven years ago. Like if they were PTQ grinder, they're still a PTQ grinder now. They didn't evolve to like pro tour level caliber. Uh, there are exceptions, obviously. That's why I say 95%. But most people just like jam games without really uh, with the mindset of trying to improve or, or looking to improve in any way. So they're always within, maybe they're like a tier above than they were seven years ago, but they're still in the same general area for the most part. And I hope that more people strive to um, consume content or do active things that allow them to actually reach that next level to to have those breakthroughs and people like people that i've seen break through or finally win a ptq or qualify by rptq and generally i'm just not surprised like that i'm like i've seen progress throughout the years from this person and the passion and the willingness to improve not surprised not surprised robert anderson that someone that i considered when i first started seven years ago one of the best local players he just won gp toronto not surprised so would be surprised if some of those people that I consider staying has stayed the same level throughout uh, do something like that. So, yeah, that's all I hope that people who listen to your show just really try to take something actionable from it or can actually put into words what they're doing differently. Uh, I think that's the issue. People don't really know what they're doing differently, what they're improving. They just have this way like vague sense of like why they're playing better. Oh, I'm just like more focused or. It's, sure. it's like, sure, maybe like, oh, I had more sleep. It's not really concrete. So I'm hoping people like will come out with any piece of my content that uh, something concrete that they could take away and really add to their game. Uh, for me, it's always been about uh, kind of what KYT just talked about. Like, I always hope that when you, when that, when that, and when that outro ends, like when that last bit of, what it, the goodbyes or the song, like whatever hits, I hope that um, that you got something um, and that you can look back on your past three months, your past couple weeks, your past couple days of your Magic the Gathering career and be like, am I doing this? Am I applying myself? Am I, am I t being an active participant in my improvement? Um, it's always what I want, and I hope that um, you can recognize what I recognize and that, like, um, you know, if you've listened to this podcast, you've watched me go from working at Oasis Games 
um, as like the guy that like runs the front of the store um, to like working in product making apps. Like I, I've applied most of the things that I've learned in Magic the Gathering to my real life. And I, I believe in hashtag always improving. I believe that it's like a mindset that will make you better at magic and life in general. And I think that magic is a great proponent in improving you at life. And I hope that uh, when you listen to this podcast and you listen to like why we love making magic content, you can be like, am I, am I as passionate about the thing that I'm doing and can I apply that to my life today? Uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my hope. Um, I want to give a special shout out to uh, Mr. Scotty Mack in the chat. Um, one of, one of the guys that, uh, was on the original A team and is probably the reason, one of the reasons that I'm like a podcaster today. So shout out to him. Uh, I want to, um, thank all the listeners, thank QIT. Um, and, uh, and let's, let's talk about our Patreon goal real quick. So our next goal on patreon.com, if you go to constructive criticism, uh, you can, uh, you know, check out, uh, our website, at, uh, our, our Patreon at patreon.com slash ccmtg. And uh, our next school says we're going to upgrade our recording equipment, but I actually just bought everybody microphones. So that's probably not happening. <laughs> well, uh, the, but we will, uh, at, at the next school, we actually do plan on buying sleeves and play mats um, to start selling on the website and things like that. So uh, check that out, patreon.com slash ccmtg. You can go to our spec store already. We already have t-shirts, um, mugs, stickers, things like that. Uh, so check that out on the Concerted Criticism website. Uh, Michael's got a mug. Look at his smile. <laughs> it's true. It's pretty sweet. <laughs> I'm going to guess you've used that mug three times. Probably at least four. <laughs> Don't sell me short here. <laughs> Don't sell you short. Um, if people want to find you, KYT, where can they do that? Uh, you can find me at, at KYT Magic on Twitter. I think that's the best way uh, to get to me or... or... Ship me an email at kyt at com if you want to work on, collaborate on any project together. I'm sad, I'm like seeing this, uh, that you, you started a, a show on your channel called Common Knowledge, but I was I was going to suggest that's like the perfect name for Scotty Mac to do like a blog of obvious advice. <laughs> <laughs> Common Knowledge, like... <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I didn't come up with that name. I actually owe store credit to the guy that that uh, that did. I pro- I was like, I was trying to come up with a popper name, and I'm trying to help these guys. Like, you know, uh, one of the reasons that I think Common Knowledge is such a good podcast today is actually like, I'm like, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Like, please just do it this way. I promise your show will be better. Like, don't make all the mistakes that I made. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but where, where yeah, else that's... can I find you? Um, just check out First Strike every uh, Monday, 9 p.m. Eastern. It, it's uh, something I'm really enthusiastic about just because I found the right people to make competitive style debate show. Like the whole mix, uh, it, it just was the right fit um, to make sure that we could do a show, talk about the latest hot topic without just needing to focus on, on the competitive side. So. Or go to uh, Face to Face Montreal and ask for me. <laughs> uh, Scotty Mac with the hot takes. Um, I, I do want to say also, you know, uh, I, I was skeptical, KYT, that you could make a show based off of, uh, you know, two of the worst sports commentators' work. Oh, my work. God. <laughs> you can't like, say that on this podcast. <laughs> they are so... Uh, like, they are so good. I think they just support the whole casual, like... Thing like, <laughs> and Michael Steven agrees Ace. with me, by the way. They're like so easily true. the two they're worst sports so commentators bad. of all time. They're so bad, but they're so like, it's so obvious why they're bad, so they're successful good. and so popular. It's so obviously why. They're just like super passionate about like the craziest ideas. And well, Skip was the worst. Skip is still no, the I worst. I actually don't even know that's true. I think that like, no. First Strike was my favorite show before Stephen A. got there. I was like, this show is great. And then, like, Stephen A. got there, and then it was, like, two guys just, like, screaming at it's each other. Just, and I was like, just, it's the worst. so Skip phony. I don't think they think anything. any of that. It's better than LeBron. I don't think LeBron. they actually believe any of that. I think they don't they believe just... anything they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's, that's, why so just, fake. that's why First Strike is great, because Robert actually believes what he's saying. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Like, I like Stephen A. Smith, actually. I think he's the more reasonable of the two. So, mm, all right. That Mike, says more about your co-host than it does about you. 
<laughs> if Stephen A is the reasonable one, you're in trouble. Uh, <laughs> you can, can find me on Facebook. My name is Michael Hendrock. You can also find me on Twitter at MagicMikeMTG. You can find me on Facebook at Spencer Stephen Helen. You can find me on Twitter, Spencer13H. You can find me on uh, MTG at Spencer13Dev. You can find the podcast every week on MTGCast.com, ConstructiveCriticism.com, Twitch slash TV slash CCMTG, and on our YouTube channel. Um, also, uh, you know, I uh, just want to give a special shout out to KYT for coming on this week. And sure, I'd like to extend the offer. I'll trade you Michael Hinderocker for Robert for episode 201 of Constructive Criticism. So <laughs> you talk to Robert about that. I know I'm downgrading. I know I'm giving up silver for bronze. But uh, uh, but Robert's pretty cool. So I, I, I'll, I'll make the trade offer as our listeners suggest. <laughs> Just for one episode. <laughs> you you do with that what you will. <laughs> you can join the conversation by uh, joining our Facebook group on the Concerted Criticism family. You can also uh, join the Concerted Critics group by becoming a patron of $5 or more. We really appreciate it. Um, every dollar is really appreciated. Every listener of the show just donated $1 per month. Uh, Michael and I would be able to quit our jobs and uh, do magic full time. Like it would, I would make more while paying Michael. <laughs> than I do at my current job. So uh, every if every listener did that, it would it would change our lives. It, it's really appreciated. So uh, you can also join the conversation uh, by joining our Discord channel. Uh, just ask for an invite. You can also find it on our BIOS page uh, where you can join the clan by messaging me at Sponsor13Dev on MTGO. Or you can tweet at us with hashtag with that be good. Hashtag with that be good is our Twitter outreach program. If you tweet it, we'll read it. Um, so let's uh, let's get started on this one. So we have Got My Signed Lord of Curses by Austin Godels. Uh, hashtag would that be good? Um, I, don't, I don't know why you want yourself to sign your own cards, Mason. Uh, Did we not get through these last time? Oh, no, because uh, it's Wednesday. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, it's Wednesday now. Uh, uh, okay. We're recording on the wrong day, Michael. Yeah, I, I'm not that smart sometimes. No. Most of the time. Uh, I don't know why anybody would want cards signed by Austin. I feel like that depreciates the card value by a significant margin. But, you know, you do, you, Mason. Great. I just really want to kill someone with a you know a bunch of signs, obviously, and when someone asks who they are, just, oh, no, Austin signed these. Oh, don't you know Austin Godels? Don't, don't you know? Yeah. Don't you know him, bro? Don't you good know? Me. Uh, great episode of CCMG happening following, uh, followed by The Bachelor at, at ABC after. Who will she pick? Um, uh, I feel like we should have gotten to these, but we obviously didn't. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. Mason lost the episode. That's why we haven't read these on the show before. I see. I see. Uh, we can jump past to uh, <laughs> what? What do you? What do you want to jump? You want to jump? We to have. Me? We have Mason. We have Mason replying to Andre Strasky, who's quoting Paulo saying. I just brought in three warping whale to counter Supreme Verdict. That might not have been smart. And Mason says, I think playing that deck was the first mistake. Oh, I assume that we're talking about the uh, the great old Eldrazi Tron. What do you think yeah. about bringing in, bringing in warping whale against uh, against Supreme Verdict, Supreme Verdict KYT? <laughs> um, man. Yeah, I mean, you, once it, it resolves, you, you can make one, a scion. It's yeah, really it powerful. It gives you a one one at instant speed after they wreck you. <laughs> It exiles their Snapcaster mage. It's really powerful. I I take it that your laugh means you're not pro warping will. I mean, if if your opponent lets it happen, if neither of you realize, like, I don't know, whose I'll responsibility is it to remember that Supreme Verdict can't be countered? <laughs> Dude, straight up, I brought in. Uh, Ah uh, man, what was it? I I was a PTQ at Epic Puzzles and Games, and I I feel like I brought a, like damnationed, like a Thrun the Rat last roll, and like felt like the biggest idiot in the world. Just like regenerate. Oh no, no, it was Supreme. Ver I don't even remember what it was, because 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 uh, damnation makes it so they can't be regenerated. So sure. whatever I did didn't work the way I thought it did. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, but it's hard to kill anyways. You can't blame yeah. yourself. Andrew Andrea says, "Married my best friend today. She's beautiful and the best person I know. She's my force of will and my third Tron land. Hashtag would that be good? 
Well, if you have Karn in your hand, Andrew, and you know, and she's always there next to you, then I, I think that your third turn land will be pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. As long as it's not the third of the same Tron land. That's less good. Oh, snap. Uh, at CCMG, Popper Limited, hashtag with a good. Nothing to do with uh, nothing to do with me playing in Scorpion God, Ronos, and uh, Neheb in the same pool. What do you think, KYT? Uh, Mono Common Limited? <laughs> Mono Common. Mono Common? Yeah. Would you play a set that only has commons? In, in what, like... Can we no, make it's just, someone it, better? Can we make them, like, you know, no, do no. things like Ronos? You just, oh. you just cut all of the rares and all the uncommons from every set, and you only pay with the commons. And that's the what I'm at. From now all... I can have to complain about, then. <laughs> <laughs> how, how can I whine about my opponent's pool when they have only commons? <laughs> we'll just Is be it... reading the same tweet, except it'll be complaining about Gustwalker. <laughs> can my opponent have Gustwalker... Yeah. KYT? Is this like for constructed and limited? Wait, no, it's just it's just limited. He's just a hashtag with a good. Um Would it be good? Would it be good? I would want I would want to try it out, yeah. Without the, the haymakers. There we go. KYT says that would be good. Uh yes, I love it. This is a definite hashtag with a good. Uh this is this is in response to me talking about the new Kesha album. K, uh KYT where do you know you're anti pineapple on pizza? Are you pro Kesha? I am. I love her new single. So she has. I she guess. has a whole new album out. Yeah, I've only listened to the new single "Praying." The praying. I, thought, I think. I think that song is uh, legit. So what? You what the? Listen, you should listen to him. Him is her best song on that album. Okay, I'll check it out later. I, I uh, wonder what uh, Karaoke King Scotty says. I mean, if if he ooh. if he ever sings "Praying." In a karaoke party, I'd, I'd be blown away. So, boom! <laughs> Bachelor in Paradise is awesome this season. So hype, not hype for how they handle it though. Hashtag would that be good? Uh, so, Corinne was only on one episode. Michael, how do you feel about that? <laughs> well, you know how I feel about that. <laughs> I, I don't, Just I don't. Eternal disappointment. Eternal. He wanted more Corinne, guys. One more Corinne. Thank you everybody for listening. We appreciate uh KYT for coming on. Don't forget to check out uh patreon.com slash ccmtg and all of our sponsors. Uh and we'll see you guys all next week. Bye everybody. Bye.